enough bullets in the world for all them podcasts. Now, Ooh, okay, the okay, the alt for that is there ain't enough podcasts in the world for all them crackers. Mm. <laughs> Both <laughs> kind of are true. Which, which that is, by the way. That is an accurate re- assessment of the podcast industry right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. I am, as someone who thinks people should uh, say crackers more often. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to cast my vote for that one. Okay. Ign- acknowledging that it may be controversial. <laughs> sure. That's why I put it second, because I wanted to actually frame it so that it, people had to accept it. You know what I'm saying? Let me give them the yes, underwhelming right. one first, and then let's all get on board with uh, saying uh, cracker. Um, Bring back cracker. Now, can I say, I, I was looking, because uh, the quotes, the quotes uh, page for this movie is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, ripe with options. Uh, and many of them are things I j- cannot say on microphone. So I looked to the tagline. This movie has an incredible tagline, but uh, not one that I can easily turn into a podcast opening. Do you know what the tagline is for this movie? No. I don't know if there are multiple posters for this movie, but this no, one. No, okay, not really. Because this one has no actors on it, no faces on it, no uh, names above the title. It is just, it's it's like a photo, very dark, hard to even make out anything with the sign that says, Welcome to Rosewood, and then far off in the distance, uh, Rosewood on fire, right? And smoke rising right. from it. And it says, in 1923, a black town in Florida was burned to the ground. Its people murdered because of a lie. Some escaped and survived because of the courage and compassion of a few extraordinary people, period. This film is for them. That's quite a tagline. It is. But I will say, it's not like, I don't know. It's not making the casual that's uh, what I was gonna you know, say. multiplex visitor be like, oh, well, that sounds like a barrel of laughs. I mean, you know, what are you going to do, I guess? It's interesting that the tagline doesn't end with this is their story. It ends with this is for them. Right. That's um, the interesting thing for me. That difference of like a couple of words might have been the difference of like $15 million at the domestic box office, right? Because if you say this is for this is their story, it's almost like, Oh shit, fuck. I want to hear the story. What's the story? And then the second you say this is for them, it's like, is this homework? You know? <laughs> but it's it's it is true. Like it's it true. is true that it's that's the movie's films. energy. Right, 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 right. And it's like, you know, we're unearthing a story that's been, you know, really preserved only in people's memories, not in like records and all that, you know. So like get blah blah blah. But Look, there was one other poster griff that I can find that is very like doesn't seem like was used much where they've superimposed Ving Rames and John right. Voight onto that. Because that I think is like the DVD cover and stuff. Right. Um, but it's not a it's I don't know. It doesn't really tell you much. It's like Ving Rames with a shotgun and then John Voight's just kind of standing behind him going like like that. Well, I want to get. Know, it's not the sexiest poster. Uh, I mean, Ving Rhames very sexy. Uh, sure, uh, we all know as pre-established on this podcast. In my opinion: the sexiest poster of all time is the uh, individual character poster from Good Luck Chuck, centered around Jessica Alba's character, where she is holding an ice cream cone, and the ice cream, which is uh, vanilla, is dripping onto her hand. And the tagline is "There's uh, something about Jessica." Uh, poster that uh, was you had in, on on your wall or in something. My dorm room, yeah. That's embarrassing. I look. I'm throwing myself under the bus. Uh, it's. I need to atone. If it makes you feel better, all the posters I had in my dorm room were very sort of like dorm room pretentious guy posters. Like okay, Pink Floyd what did you and, have? List them. Oh boy. <laughs> I think I had a Pink Floyd poster. Okay. I had definitely had a like Kill Bill poster. Cool. I had. Did I have a Hendrix poster? Probably. Wow. Um. Yeah. Sort of like your sta- your standard issue eighteen year old boy thinks he thinks he has good taste. Yeah, uh, a set of posters. I had a Memento poster in my dorm room. I remember that really showing out my Christopher Nolan fandom at wow. the time. I'm trying to remember what else. I had a Coltrane poster because I had a whole jazz phase. That was my pretentious poster. You had a I don't think I know phase? about yeah. Ben's oh, jazz yeah. phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got really deep into jazz. 
What? A, oh, and I, glow in the dark posters though too. Come on, guys. You're talking no. black light or glow in the dark or both? Well, that's what I mean. Black light. Okay. Okay. No, I I, I had to get a distinction here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think it was like it was like a I don't know. It was like a slug or something. Or no, it was like Jabberwocky, but it was smoking like a hookah. I had one of those. Sure. Got it. Absolutely. I, I had the Jessica Alba one, and then I had a, a giant uh, French Toy Story poster that was uh, Woody with his arms crossed. Like one of the promo shots where he's like yeah. looking, giving Buzz the side eye. And then the, the tagline in big French letters was, Woody, he will touch your heart. <laughs> Man, remember when... When you were a teenager and it was just like, if you got a poster, you were like, that's going on my wall, probably like just yeah. any poster you could get your hands on. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to uh, interest the show because we were we were burning up some takes on the marketing of this film and how it didn't mm. work and what could have saved this movie, which I want to get into now that we're talking about posters and everything, because this is, of course. Blank check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. And this. Yeah is yeah yes you were fast congratulations it's a podcast Very about fast. filmographies directors who are given who experience massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want and sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce baby and this is a mini series on the films of john singleton we're calling it pods in the cast and today we're talking about what is arguably his last big blank check movie right like uh, from this point on he sort of goes to a one for me one for them system that becomes overwhelmingly ones for them i would say he really mostly just does like he he shifts into i want to do more commercial movies like baby the boy, only movie right baby boy's the only one after this and that's that's not a, a huge scale movie that's no. like a, a relatively that's yeah. what i'm saying don't you don't you think he's thinking in his mind cool here's what i'll do one for me one for them and then it becomes he makes one more for himself and like five more for them. Uh, yeah. But he's also talked about, I mean, he wanted to prove we'll get into all of this. You, yeah. He wanted to sort of like, he wanted to prove himself as a commercial, you know, a successful commercial director. Right. Which I think uh, in that sphere, yeah. I think a lot of guys get trapped in that. They get frustrated with the perception of like, Oh, I'm not, a commercial filmmaker i can't make things that connect with audience i want to prove them wrong and then they spend the rest of their career still trying to grind that axe you know yeah um but look we'll get to that in future weeks because today we're talking about rosewood his 1997 uh historical epic that was inexplicably released in february not you know a wide release in february after a qualifying run for the Oscars, nope. no, just straight released in February. Uh, yeah, it was given yeah a, a one thousand screen theater release in the middle of February. Um, we're gonna do the box office game, but it was up against bizarre competition. We're you know in the middle of an Oscar season that it's not a part of, mm -hmm. and it didn't you know it, it played at the Berlin Film Festival, which was you know probably was happening around the same time. That's a February film festival, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I feel you know it got good reviews, but it, so I feel like you know kind of golf clap type reviews, like oh this is good, you know like yeah, but not overwhelming, and it was kind of forgotten. And the next movie John Singleton makes is Shaft, like, and it just feels like him being like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I made four movies in a row that are worthy and interesting and sort of more positioned as awards players and mostly ignored after boys in the hood. So right. I'm going to do something else. Did I mean, did I they know. even, did each one go down at the box office? Like, am I correct mm -hmm. in thinking it's like higher learning grosses more less than poetic justice? I, I get what you're asking. Even less? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Let's, it, let's I mean, see. it makes perfect sense for him to do shaft, but I want to talk about, the framing. You're, you're sort of correct. Okay. Higher Learning made a little more than Poetic Justice, Weird. but then Rosewood is down. Okay. So I don't know. Um, want to talk about the framing of this movie. Want to talk about the movie itself. And boy, do we have a good cast. One of our favorite people here on the show. And uh, uh, one of the most inexplicably overqualified guests uh, we have ever on this show. Uh, from the New York Times, 
uh, and from, of course, the uh, infamous fund the police story campaign for Jackie Chan in the 2021 March Madness competition. Please welcome back to the show, Jamel Bowie. Uh, hello, guys. Glad to be here. Jamel, you and I were DMing a long time ago because this Singleton Mini has been on the books for a while, and I must have mentioned it. And you just... I just remember you being like, David, I have to be on the Rosewood episode. There's no... There, you know, this was not a thing where, you know, you were like, oh, Singleton, interesting. Like, oh, there's a bunch. You were you were very focused that you wanted this movie. Yeah. Um, I was on for, last episode was almost Forrest Gump. I don't I really have a history with that movie. I feel like I had the same history that everyone has with that movie. Everyone our age has with that movie. But Rosewood is a movie that I have a history with. I yeah, saw Just it. to clarify quickly. Sorry. Are, would you say that your history with Forrest Gump is that Forrest Gump sort of like wandered into your life briefly touched you changed the way you saw the world forever and then went on to his next adventure yeah pretty much you know okay. forrest yeah, he had a newspaper with him well, i had a newspaper with me and he was like might be fun to write in that run day and i was like you know what forrest <laughs> it would be um, old york times they should try doing a new york times <laughs> <laughs> uh no, I saw. So I saw Rosewood comes out in '97. I would have been like 10 or 11 when this movie came out. I didn't see it in theaters, but once it hit sort of the HBO rotation, um, is when I saw it as a kid. And this wasn't the case of me like stumbling, you know, browsing uh, television, staying up too late and like watching a movie. This was very much a case of my parents and my dad in particular watching the movie and wanting me to wa wanting me to watch it with him. And the reason for that is that Rosewood takes place in Sumner County, Florida, which is in the Florida panhandle. Um, if you've only ever been to Miami or to Tampa, those places are like not – the panhandle is nothing like those places. The panhandle handle is southern Georgia. It's southern Alabama. It's like very rural. It's, it's very much – when you imagine kind of like the, the – rural backwards south that is the florida panhandle and it's where my dad's family's from sort of my a lar large part of my family is all in the florida panhandle not in sumner county but in sort of the next county over and so the story of rosewood is a story that my dad was familiar with just from having spent his childhood in like rural uh northern florida um, and it's one of those things. And I think last year, or was it two years ago, when HBO's Watchmen debuted and people yeah. were like, learned about the Tulsa massacre. It's one of those things for which prior to, you know, relatively recent memory, the only people who really kind of knew about it were black people from the area. So, right, like the Tulsa massacre was well known among black families in Tulsa and Oklahoma City and that surrounding area because it was like very much part of the history of the black community there. Um, there's a whole, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, but there's, there's sort of a whole bunch of these incidents that take place in like the 1910s and twenties. And so I was about to say something like, oh, you can, you know, if you're from Nicodemus, Kansas, or you're from, I mean, you can kind of go down the list of horrible things sure. like this that happen in the United States, uh, to black communities. And so Rosewood is in some sense sort of like a, pr like almost a paradigmatic example of it. And also the ways in which it happens, uh, it's more or less immediately lost to, to mainstream historical memory and pretty much exists as like an oral tradition and recollections amongst local blacks until, you know, interested people dig it back up again um, long after the events. That, that's all to say that like my connection to this movie, it's not, I, I don't, I'm not like, you know, descended from anyone, but I know this area of Florida. Like I've spent a large part of my childhood during the summers, like, you know, two hours away, more or less, in this part of Florida. Um, and the history of this part of Florida is very much, like, entwined in the history of my family. My lack of an accent betrays the fact, or belies the fact that I, 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 my whole family's from the rural south. Yeah. And this region in particular, um, I'm, fam I'm very familiar with. But, I, I mean, I think you, like... You hit the nail on the head on the main thing that 
Singleton is trying to do in this movie, which is genuinely, earnestly educate people. Unlike a lot of other historical dramas, it's like he's making a movie about a thing that he knows most of the audience will have literally zero baseline knowledge about, right? I mean, it's like, uh, in and the poster and that, you know, uh, very, very kind of po face tagline speak to that as well. It's like, I, I think, uh, I kept thinking back to like, um, when, uh, uh, Vice came out, which I'm seeing here was, uh, one of the best movies. <laughs> yeah, it was named one of the five best pictures of the year by uh, yeah. the Academy of Motion by Pictures everyone? and Sciences. Right. Everyone um, was screaming, they, they have to see Vice. They have, they to, have see to see Vice. Vice, Vice, People Vice. People were all Vice. about it. But, but like, look, Adam McKay, who I generally like a lot, right? I don't like that movie, but I'm a fan of the man. I saw, I remember someone was clowning on the movie on Twitter and like, um, McKay went like full bodied after them and sort of said, like, I don't understand why you're clowning on me. This movie was made with very good intentions. It, it, an incredibly bad series of things happened because of this regime. And I really want people to know about it. I'm earnestly trying to educate people. And there was this I, I remember, the, you know, just having this feeling of like. This happened in recent history. It's been talked right. about obsessively. It was talked about at the time and has been talked about even more with a little bit of distance. You know, there's no one who's seeing Vice who is going to be blindsided by this, you know? <laughs> and, like, I'm a moron. And even I watching Vice was like, I don't think there's anything in here that I didn't already know. And I could very easily be taught a lot more about the Bush administration than I know. Whereas Rosewood is literally Singleton being like, can I let you know that this existed in the first place and then get into the details of it? Um, but he's also sort of putting... Uh, you know, he's fictionalizing a story within the center of this very real event that people don't know about uh, outside of an oral tradition, as you said. Well, let me add to the, the point real quick, just to say that I think, you know, the, an audience orientation and a, a white audience specifically approaching this isn't just going to be, I don't know anything about this, but they may be incredulous that something like this could even happen. And I think this is sort of one of the key things about these episodes of uh racial violence in the country especially these like mass ones like if this were if this were a movie about an individual lynching right if this were a dramatization of the killing of emmett till no problem and i think that movie probably would have done much better yeah but like this kind of collective racial violence is something that is more or less been like obliterated from like public memory right like no one up until recently, really, I mean, up until quite recently, this was just not a thing that existed in, in most Americans' headspace. And so I, I have to imagine, we'll get into this because I have a whole theory here, but I have to imagine that this was specifically a problem in the middle of the 1990s, yeah. which has a lot of things going on in terms of historical memorialization that I think would affect how this movie was received. I also feel like the 90s were this time of pushback on how Hollywood took liberties with real life stories and historical events, whereas that used to sure. sort of be de rigueur. I feel like in the 90s, I've been watching a ton of fucking Siskel and Ebert on YouTube when I can't sleep. And so I, you know, it's just interesting to always watch the context of them talking about movies in the week that they came out and addressing whatever the sort of public response seems to be. And in the, the 90s, there's a lot more pushback, I feel like, of Ebert saying, like, audiences are complaining, critics are complaining that this was changed from real life. I don't care if it makes the movie interesting, right? If the point, if the larger point's being made. It did feel like there was that going on. And when you have a story that most people don't know, and especially, you know, the, the vast majority of white America don't know, and then you're adding in elements like the Ving Rhames character, who is like this kind of classical movie superhero placed into this tragedy. I do think people are just like, I can't believe that most of this is real. Like, how much of this is then, you know, fictionalized? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I think that's part. I mean, I. it's interesting. We we were talking, Jamal, you mentioned, I think, on Twitter, like, Amistad came out this year. Yeah. And that's a movie that I think is tremendously flawed. And uh, we talked about it on this podcast in one of our shortest episodes ever uh -huh. <laughs> a long time ago. Um, 
and is I feel like Hollywood sort of like rolling up its sleeves. Steven Spielberg at the height of his, you know, DreamWorks powers post Oscar being like, I'm going to make a definitive movie about the horrors of slavery and, you know, the middle passage and like, you know, I'm going to dig into all this. And he mostly makes a courtroom drama about John Quincy Adams, you know, convincing the Supreme Court that like, you know, slaves, these, these people should be free. Like, you know, like, you know, it's, and, and that's a movie that takes historical liberties and so on as well. Like, you know, much like, you know, like that, that movie also burnishes things. We talked about it at the time. We should also say like the first 45 minutes or so of Amistad that are actually about the Amistad ship are far and away the best part of the movie. And then after that, everything he's trying to do in the rest of the movie, he just improves upon 15, 20 years later with Lincoln. It's like a dry run for what he ultimately kind of gets right with Lincoln. It feels like Hollywood's like, well, that's the only way we can approach this, right? right. Like just this, right. we, 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 we got to do the heavyweight thing. We got to do the sort of like uh oscar movie and this rosewood is not a small movie and it's not a and it's a studio movie i do like you know warner brothers made this movie uh it's from a major director who's oscar nominated or whatever but i feel like the approach he's taking is quietly kind of radical yeah yeah i mean this to 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 pick up on what i had said earlier you know in it Amistad came out this year, but I, I actually think the the more relevant kind of point of contrast with this movie is all of the World War II memorialization that was going on in this I part love of the decade, right? Yeah, like the uh, you know the 50th anniversary of the end of the wars in '95. Um, you know, Saving Private Ryan isn't for the year after this, I think. Yeah, but you yeah. kind of you 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 have like a really serious ramp up of lots of pop culture material around. World War II, earlier in the decade, and I think this is relevant too, you have movies like Schindler's List, you have a greater awareness of the Holocaust and sort of like mainstream popular discussion. And I think that, you know, one of my, my watching this for the first time since I was like 12 or whatever, 11 or 12, the thing that stuck out to me is how much of the movie is pointed at sort of critiquing white masculinity. Uh, and I don't think that critique makes any sense outside of the context of a period where there is a big public valorization of sort of a traditional white masculinity, right? Sort of like the greatest generation that many fought in the Second World War. And then there's also this sort of pop, you know, with the with the popularization of Holocaust remembrance amongst sort of Americans at large, you have, uh, you know, like basically people cosplaying in their heads what they would do in that kind of situation. And so here you have a movie that does kind of two things very explicitly. One is to say, one is it, it's constantly showing the relationship of uh, the ability to inflict racialized violence, sh showing that relationship to ideas of white masculinity and white manhood. And then it's also showing even decent white people basically being flummoxed about what to do in the midst of all of this. And that to me, both those things together seem like a very pointed response to the World War II discourse happening at the time. Yeah, I also think, you know, all these other movies we're comparing this to have a common thread, which is they're choosing to focus on a sliver of the story that is about a small win, right? That proves the essential goodness of humanity. Yes, right. But look, Schindler right. had this list. He got some people out. Matthew McConaughey was the one good white lawyer. He fought to make this right. man free. You know, there are like stories that have this sort of centering of like, well, this thing was incalculable, but we're going to focus on this one good thing that happened in the middle of it. And even something like Save It Private Ryan is like, they got this one guy out. They got him out. You know, it's like you can save the one. Uh, and, and this movie, well, let's put it this way. This story does not have that, right? 
and they're he's choosing to put the Ving Rhames character in as this sort of like almost folk hero, right? I mean, this like sort of cowboy archetype man with no name who can ride up, save the people, and then like go on to whatever his next adventure is. Um, but as this movie is presented to the public, it just seems like, oh, this is just a story about unrelenting awfulness. There's no conceivable yeah. win here. You know, well, they, it, they wiped a, a right. place off the map and, right. you know, it was forgotten almost instantly right. except by the people who were there. Right. right. But there's a difference in framing there of Singleton saying, like, this is my attention must be paid movie rather than my here's the story about the human spirit in the face of unbearable darkness, you know, and how one man can make a difference. And Jamel, right before we were recording, you were saying that you, well, you should, I'll, I'll let you say this yourself, talking about uh, tweeting about the movie last night. Oh yeah. Just that there wasn't very much. I mean, usually when I tweet about movies, like there's a lot of engagement and I just noticed that there was very little engagement on this sort of tweets about this movie. I think part of that's just because it is a basically forgotten movie. Um, yeah, like, you know, we've been it's we're like, you know, two or three years in now to sort of like broad public awareness of racial justice. I don't mean to say that in a flip way, although I do have complicated feelings about it. Um, but through all of that, I mean, after the after Watchmen, after the Watchmen HBO show came out, you would think that this movie would sort of rear its head in kind of the discourse, but like. No, there's like there's nothing there's nothing there. And I wonder if it if it is because it is it is a pretty bleak movie. I mean, I was saying to my wife when we were watching and we were finishing it last night that if not for Ving Rames' character, this might actually be unbearable to watch. Like yeah. Ving Rames' character acts as basically a, re a release for the audience so that, so that you can have not just someone to root for, but like you can be like, oh, someone's doing something. Right. That the, the, the movie can feel like it has any sort of win. Yeah. Because yeah, you know, uh, uh, John Voight's character. I mean, him and his wife end up hiding people, but like it's very fraught for them. They like they're like we don't we don't we almost don't want to do this, <laughs> right? They're basically bullied into it, and you yeah. know that John Voight's character is you know like fundamentally he's very flawed. We've known that from the start, honestly. But like you know, he's he's not taking up arms or whatever with the the rest of the mob, but still like. He, it push comes to shove, he doesn't want to do it. He he's right. you know he basically has to be forced. He's driven by money, pretty much every time. Consistently. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, he's he's the sort of you know benevolent guy, and you know who's like, oh, I'm happy in the community. I'm I'm a friend to all. And then right. the second someone's bidding against him in the auction, who's not white, he's like, well, what the the. You know, this isn't right. We'll we'll talk about his character. He, he's an interesting, conflicted character, but it's also right. he's not a white savior. Almost right. Almost right. any other filmmaker at this time, which is to say, any white filmmaker who would have had the ability to get this movie greenlit right at this scale, would have centered the story around him. Right? Would have made yeah. it that this guy's conflicted, and then he learns the fundamental lesson and steps up right to the plate he cannot stay silent anymore and he's very much a character in a larger tapestry the the thing i kept thinking watching this is just like you know i mean jamel you're talking about how the movie feels so sort of uh, would be unbearable if not for the ving rames thing right which is sort of the one kind of like he, the character almost feels fantastical. Like he almost feels supernatural. Like he's like Pecos Bill or something, right? Right, right, right. Like he's like rolling into town and he has no backstory that you really. His name, his name is Man, right? Right. He's, he's just, he's, he's just, he's like just, he's archetypal man. Right. And, right. and that kind of keeps you afloat, but also the fact that it's like a historical movie that is assuming that you don't know any of this other than how badly this is going to end because of the expectations the movie is setting itself. Uh, but um, the, the, the thing that this is most structured like in my eyes is a disaster movie more than your traditional historical drama because it is pretty ensemble-y. It is pretty spread out. Right. It's got this opening like 45 minutes to an hour that is just sort of like, let's set up all the little satellite narratives, right? Here are the groupings, here are the this and that. And then it's about like 
and then the fucking dam breaks and everything goes to hell and some of the people you love get killed off immediately and you're watching as the pieces rearrange themselves who's going to be the skeleton crew and how do they get out of this some way right like how do they somehow survive the wreckage and right it's like ving rames ends up you know is is the other interesting thing is it feels like this is halfway to the thing that now Tarantino has become obsessed with doing for the last decade, which is like, can I present a horrible tragedy or within a horrible setting, add in these fantastical elements of how I wish things could have gone, right? What if you had had a classic movie hero that could come in and fucking take shit into their own hands? I think it's right. And I think there's something... You know, one critique of Django Unchained, right, is sort of like the Jamie Foxx character is, despite being a former slave, is sort of like weirdly magically outside the context of the antebellum South. Like he, the social forces of that of the of the of the era don't really impact him. That's part of what makes him magical, that he can talk any way he wants. He can carry himself any way he wants. And he's sort of like a fully realized individual in a way that is very modern and that like could probably couldn't have happened for, you know, for, for a, a free, a free or freed black person in the period. And Ving Rames's character, man, what's interesting is that at this, as much as he is a kind of wish fulfillment and there's a moment, I think a very pointed moment of wish fulfillment when two kids are about to get shot. And then like, he shows up to save them in a very like dramatic, uh, dramatic scene. But he's still very much bound by the social conventions. He is he is both he is both a heroic archetype, sort of wish fulfillment, but also sort of wish fulfillment very much grounded in the world that all the other characters live in. Like he he wants to escape at first because he's like, Listen, I'm just some guy. Like I just I just showed up here. I showed up in here with a horse and I have a lot of money. They're just gonna they're gonna like fucking kill me. There's no question about this. The thing is, though, as he says when he's saying, I want to get out of here, he is also this like nightmare figure to uh, a lot of the white people in the movie because he's sort of confident. He's a veteran. He knows how to, you know, he he has guns. He has money and he's like mysterious. So he becomes the. they're like, well, he it must be him. He must be the villain. He must be the sort of like imaginary thing we're chasing because he's so right. Like he, he gets to operate on both sides, both as sort of, you know, fantasy hero and fantasy villain. Right. 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 And well, and he, he functions as sort of like a human trigger to the white people of this town. I mean, obviously there's the inciting incident that, that is historically accurate, but I also feel like he's representational. He's sort of a, a human embodiment of, of you know the white citizens of rosewood's fear like wait a second what if they realize they could be equal right like what 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 if they start walking around with this sense of uh confidence um that's sort of like you know it's i mean it's all this fucking shit that we've been dealing with uh forever but that has certainly been like uh, feeling amped up for the last couple of years of just like, wait a second, why do we need to change anything? You know, this sort of white pushback to like, uh, uh, hold on, hold on. Let's all just like, what about the way things were like five years ago? Can everyone just like reset back to that? I don't understand why anyone feels like they need more than they currently have right now. It's just the 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 example of Rose with this little town. It, there's nothing fancy about this town at all. It's just, I think the... I was reading, I think, an LA Time, Times article or something. Like the the only thing people would say about it when they're remembering is like all the houses were painted. So like you know, it's like it's it's small. It doesn't have much infrastructure, but it's nice. It's sort of you know kept up, and it, everyone there is you know carving out a life for themselves. And that example alone is just like frightening to people. Like that's you know I- enough to essentially make this place like teetering on the edge of risk just right. by existing right there's that tension at the very beginning of the movie before ostensibly anything goes wrong that's just like uh, you know like whenever you're cutting to the michael rooker character or whatever you can you can feel them just sort of saying like okay but this is like the most we're going to allow uh david yes griffin i have a question for you 
Is it time for an ad read? I guess so. Sure. It's around that time in the episode. We, you know, debut some information from a sponsor of the show. What's another way you could answer in the affirmative? Indeed. Oh! Yeah, I see what you're doing there. That's, I, I mean, doing. to be fair, I probably should have communicated. It was That was pretty broad guidelines. I, I could have led you a little more cleanly to where I wanted to go. What I wanted to do was talk about Indeed. Yeah, it's the job site. It makes hiring as easy as one, two, three. Post screen and interview all on Indeed. It, as easy as one, two, three. Who runs this job site? Feist? Who runs this job site? Billy Wilder? Okay. Yeah, yours is better because Feist was one, two, three, four. I'm I'm not doing well on my my alley oops tonight. Look maybe it's time for you to hire a new co-host, David. And if you wow. want to get your quality short list of candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description faster and, and only pay for the candidates that meet must-have qualifications and schedule and complete video interviews in your Indeed dashboard, if those are all things you want to do, then you should sign up for Indeed. Uh, yeah, you know, it makes connecting with the right talent very fast and easy. Uh, they have the instant match, which gives you quality candidates whose resumes fit your description, and the skills test, which reduce hiring time by 27%. You can choose from over 130 skills tests. You can have must-have requirements, so you only pay for applications that meet them. Uh, according to Talent Nest, they deliver four times more hires than all other job sites combined. Look, if you're hiring, you need Indeed. Yeah, so you can get started right now with a free $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash check. You can get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash check. Sounds good. Yeah, Indeed.com slash check. The offer is valid through June 30th. Terms and conditions apply. You're not actually going to hire a new co-host, are you? Never. In don't. I don't know. What's the opposite of Indeed? Yeah, in don't. Yeah. Two things related to the general conversation, but first to Michael Rooker. I feel kind of bad that Michael Rooker both looks and sounds like an old Southern racist. I know. I, yes. I we're gonna yes. we're gonna have to get into this more. Look, yes, he's like Daniel Brühl. If you cast Daniel Brühl in a Hollywood movie about World War II, where you're like, well, I know who Michael Rooker's playing. Like, and the right. thing, the fact of the matter is, he's actually playing a slightly, slightly more complicated character than some right, of right. the people in this movie. But, but yes, I mean, like remember when Michael Rooker like dropped into like The Walking dead or whatever you're like well I, yeah. I don't think this guy is gonna be the most like you know have the most broad perspective on life <laughs> I, I, I i'm gonna i'm gonna pull like rule southerner identity real quick and just say that like he just he he sounds like a redneck he just he that's just right just just how he sounds and he's got the face too and it, like he's had that face his entire life you know like even when he was young it's funny that it was like, okay, his breakthrough performance is Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. And it's like, okay, this guy's got to escape typecasting. And he's like, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. I'll just hide out in, in uh, a virulent racist for the next couple of decades. <laughs> so people don't think of me as that sociopath anymore. Um, even, even when he even when he isn't playing virulent racist, like in, in uh, what, Days of Thunder, that, that Tom Cruise yeah. NASCAR mm -hmm. movie, it's like, yeah, Michael Rooker seems like a good guy. Probably says the N word. Well, and also, like, <laughs> let's say, of course, even in freaking Guardians of the Galaxy, I was gonna got, say you know, he's got an Alabama accent. Right. His role as Yondu, the only true male feminist. You you do watch that movie, and part of sort of like the juice of that casting is what if an alien sounded like a racist? Like the character <laughs> isn't, but that's part of the incongruity of just like, oh, this is interesting energy. This isn't what I usually like, get out of aliens in these kinds of movies. His first lines are him bragging that he didn't eat that's Peter the other Quill. Thing. Like, like the he's character basically is like specious. I am a hill person. Right. Yeah, like is, is sort of his right his, his anti, take on the aliens. Thing is like, oh, I'll make it clear. I don't like humans. Right, right. Um, the other thing I was just gonna say real quick is that uh for for all for as much as the, the story is embellished and you know that Thing Rame's character is uh is from you know it's a fabrication, it's made up for the story. 
things like the fact that it was a place like Rosewood that was so vulnerable to this kind of collective violence it does actually ring and very true and does reflect the actual circumstances of these sorts of events. It was it was never it was rarely the case that you saw this kind of like collective racial violence inflicted on places that were dramatically worse off than the, the nearby white community. And especially in the South, you know, the, 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 um, uh, terms like segregation, like really kind of overstate the amount of separateness, right. That like, it was like segregated social spheres, but in terms of everyday life, it was actually very intimate for like a, a variety of reasons. Uh, but it, it was not the poorest places. It was always the places where there was like that they were roughly the same economically, right? right. right where where uh, where a, a a black farmer might have enough money to buy some land and really settle and have some pr- prosperity. And when you look at sort of the history of lynching, and this was this was an observation made like in the eighteen nineties by Ida B. Wells. Uh, the the southern journalist um the targets of lynchings often were landowners business owners relatively prosperous people who weren't just it wasn't just sort of like oh we hate these black people it was like no this is economic competition right um and 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 the 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 prospect of economic advancement kind of implies potential social advancement and it's, yeah. it's that kind of that's where the tension comes from you have that in the in the movie you have the one guy who's like you know speaking of um uh sylvester why did i just uh forget the actor's name that's don wild. Cheadle. Uh, don Cheadle's character he mm-hmm. says that the one of the members of the mob says well he has a piano i don't have a piano and he, he says the guy who owns everything he has a piano right and that, to me, is such like a smart and subtle way of getting to what the dynamic is here. It's, it's this sense that, you know, uh, the 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 very famous, famed sociologist writer Du Bois speaks of like a psychological wage of racism, and it's this sense that sort of like they aren't getting paid the psychological wage that they expected that that creates the tension. Their 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 race isn't according them the kind of privileges that they thought. Material privileges is kind of the 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 thing that makes people mad and on edge, and you yeah. and that's like that's like a re, that's a real thing. That's like a real dynamic. Well, yeah, I mean, that, uh, yeah. Go sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. It just you, you said like it, you know that sort of like um, uh, you know material advancement Im- implies uh, a social advancement but we live in a fucking gross capitalist country where essentially it it's one in the same you know it's like the second you know things are evened out financially it, it the worst is already done in these people's eyes i think about i i've shared this before cuz i just think about it a lot but uh greta gerwig in some interview i think when she was promoting little women and people asked her about like how much better it's gotten out there for women in the film industry right and she pushed back on that and was just like it's not i mean it's like you know if i get a nomination then people write about look it's so much better but it's not and i was talking about this on set with meryl streep and i asked her like why do people feel like it's this way because uh, you know like in in the 30s and 40s you had like people like Catherine Hepburn who were major movie stars and they were the leads of their films in which they told men what to do, right? They ran the fucking table. Barbara Stanwyck as well. Like all these incredibly smart, high status, fast talking women in comedies and dramas who just fucking ruled the place. And now we don't have shit like that anymore and people act like things are better. And if there's a little bit of agency for a female character, people push back really, really hard. Uh, and Meryl Streep said, yeah, but the difference is when audiences were watching Catherine Hepburn movies or Barbara Stanwyck movies, they were fantasy. Like they, the men watching these films did not feel threatened by them because they were not encountering women like this in their actual life. They did not exist. And now a woman doing 10% of that in a movie feels like a threat because it's like, this is actually the thing I feel creeping into my life, you know? Um, and, and yes, it's like, that's, that's the breeding ground for this sort of shit is when people feel like we're on the precipice perhaps 
of actual social change happening. The Watchmen thing is also super interesting because Watchmen, I feel like there was that bell curve of like, you know, people are just assuming that show's going to suck, right? Why would they do this? They're playing with fire. The show comes out, everyone's really impressed with the first episode, but then like four days later, there's that sort of second wave of press that's like, do you know that this is real? The, the Tulsa massacre is real. Like there were just so many headlines and tweets yeah. that were like, that's not a fucking thing that they made up. And something about the framing of Watchmen where you're already dealing with alternative histories, I think made that opening more palatable to white audiences because they were just yeah. like, what is this weird sci-fi alternate history we're dealing with? that the show is building itself upon before then it started like the education started coming out of like, no, this is like the real thing. And then the fantasy is spun out of that. Whereas this movie is just asking people to like acknowledge a thing that isn't often acknowledged, which means there's already a, a sort of guilt and complicity for white audience members in just like, I'm watching a movie by a thing that I don't know about that feels like I've already fucked up in some way. It's all true. I'm trying to make sense of why this movie was sort of just like totally shrugged off in 97. I think, yeah, look, I mean, I think there's a bunch of reasons. And one of the main ones is just that the Warner Brothers probably did not have a lot of belief in it. Like they probably watched it and they were like, this is a two hour, 22 minute movie that's very, very um, sad and very upsetting and doesn't have a huge star. And we're going to dumped it like i i mean they 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 put it in berlin but they dumped it like and i think there that, that it was just sort of a commercial calculation i just have to assume right and john singleton's career which i wanted to ask you about jamel is kind of fascinating in that because he comes out of the gate with his big guarantor this sort of surprise hit that refocuses the industry a little bit for a while Rosewood is fascinating in that it's sort of him being like, okay, I want a bigger budget. I want to tackle something really meaty. And I want to make a movie that, like like you say, and the poster is going to say, like, this is for real people who suffered. And Hollywood's like, yeah, yeah, sure. But the, by the time it's coming out, they're like, okay, yeah, I don't know. Put it out in February. Who cares? Like, you know, dump it. And, like, it feels like the end of the 90s like post spike lease post john singleton boom of giving black filmmakers studio budgets for a while which i feel like kind of narrowed again in the 2000s and is only sort of widening out again recently is that crazy and let's also say uh just briefly uh and that i i very much want to hear uh jamel's sort of history with singleton at large but um the the model for black filmmakers breaking into Hollywood for about 10 years after this becomes the model Singleton kind of sets by his next wave of movies, right? Like you have people like Tim Story and F. Gary Gray who continue mm. to work within the industry, but they have to do sort of the crossover. They pivot to blockbusters, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or or like you you make a small budget comedy. But but the sort of like earnest, emotional black drama does not really exist in the studio system in a major way for a while. For a while. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you, Jamal, about your thoughts on Singleton outside of Rosewood. Like, do you have uh, like, you know, are there a lot? Have you seen all of his films? Like, are there others in his filmography that you watch a lot? I feel like a lot of his movies were in the cable rotation. You were sort of talking about Rosewood being in the cable rotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen I've seen Boys in the Hood a bunch, um, mm -hmm. and it, as like a parenthetical, for as much, the, those those the Hood movies of that period have a lot of issues, but they're all I think a lot of really compelling watches. So I, I've seen a bunch of them a ton, like Juice and Menace to Society and all of those. Right, and then sort of their successors like Paid in Full and um, uh, what's the one with Queen Latifah, the all the all female set cast. Set it um, off. Yeah, set yeah. it off. Uh, I've seen I've seen Too Fast Too Furious, Rosewood. I don't think I have not seen a. T I actually have not like sat down and gone through his entire mm -hmm. uh, filmography. So these are like the those three in Shaft. So these four are the ones that I've seen 
and seen um, uh, Brad's with this is my second time watching the others I've seen a couple times just thinking about how Singleton debuted and sort of his trajectory it seems to me that part of the challenge for him and like his peers is that they that these their their first movies these hood movies so to so to speak they were huge hits and i think there was an expectation that they would just make more of them or sort of like make more of this kind of movie and i think part of the trouble with rosewood in terms of its how the studio reacted and how the public reacted is that it very is far outside of that kind of that kind of that kind of uh, that kind of frame. The other thing I'll say is that just from th- oh, just from three movies: uh, uh, Boys in the Hood, Rosewood, and Shaft. Singleton seems to be very interested in, and uh, you might even say preoccupied with sort of black domesticity, right? Sort of like the black family. And one of my my other take about this about Rosewood is that I think it's worth considering it in the context of sort of the political and cultural discourse about the black family in the '90s, which was you know this is the era of welfare reform, this is the era of the you know, the welfare queen um, of this of a uh, this is sort of the tail end of the crack era. Um, it's pretty much a time when. For as much as there was greater representation on screen of black people, a lot of the political discourse was very much of like black pathology. But there's something wrong with black people with black families that renders them unable to really operate or compete in society. And so a movie like Boys in the Hood is interesting in part because it's offering at first glance like a, a stereotypical view of what black life is like. But as soon as you you know you sit down for the movie, what you see is this is a movie of like tight communities and tight familial bonds. That even though this is the ghetto, it is there are intact families. There are families that care about education, care about the kind of mainstream values that um, in political life it's said that black people don't really care about. And I think Rosewood is doing something interesting too, in that its its primary point of contrast within the movie is of black stable domesticity against sort of like white disorder right you're interested you're you're introduced to the black families in these like domestic scenes matriarchs patriarchs birthdays dinners churches and you're introduced to um you know the 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 character who incites all of this in i mean not only are, are is she in her home with her husband sort of like about to you don't know if they're married about to engage about to have sex maybe but they're coded as maybe low class and the character sarah sees them and is like passing judgment on them in this sort of very moralized way and i think that i think that that dynamic you got to consider in the context of what discourse about the black family was like in the middle of the 1990s right like this it is very much a to me at least it reads as a attempt to say uh, you're wrong about black families and black communities in a way that I think Boys in the Hood is saying, yes. and in a way that even a movie like Shaft, which is uh, uh, has family as a part of it, I think is also trying to trying to bring up. But I have not seen. I, I if if you guys uh, for the the two movies prior to this, I kind of yeah. wonder if you if no, you no, picked no, up on no. that as well. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's it, it, Singleton feels like you know. Uh, <laughs> to, to make a weird analogy, in the way that all of Nancy Meyer's movies are about her not being able to get over her divorce, it feels like every Singleton movie is in some way him expressing his thankfulness for his parents, right? For the upbringing he had and the guidance and the perspective that they gave him. That is sort of like, this is what gave me the stability to become a filmmaker and to have the confidence in my voice. And I'm sort of arguing for the necessity of that. And, um, you know, poetic justice is in the end, ultimately about the, the, the domestication of Tupac, right? Like the the character, not the Tupac, the person, right? But it's like, it's about him learning how to step up to the responsibility of being a father yes. and how to be an emotionally intent partner. 
Uh, exactly. Right. And to end to end romantic partner. Yes. Right. 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 And higher learning is about a lot of things, but the the predominant black storyline in the movie is a young man begging his professor to be a father figure to him, looking right. for that sort of guidance in his life, wanting the that Omar sort of Epps, support. Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne. Right. Yeah. Right. The other thing is he talks about it when he makes Boys in the Hood and when he makes all these, you know, he's he and this crucial to consider rosewood is a total pivot for him his first three movies are these californian movies like mm -hmm. they are very contemporary they're very uh much like set in the place where he's from and but he talks about like you know he was raised um by his dad was a real estate agent his mom was a, a, a pharma sales executive like he, he had he he said like i grew up in a black neighborhood i didn't know a lot of white people i had a great buffer against you know, any drama or, you know, sort of bad things like, you know, I, I loved movies. That was part of this sort of, uh, you know, that was part of what kept me sort of on the straight and narrow, blah, blah, blah. And then in this, I, there's this good article in the Times uh, written during the production of Rosewood. And I Is think this a little the, bit of the LA Times article. Yeah. In the yeah. LA Times where he says, like, I have a deep, I wouldn't call it fear, but a deep contempt for the South because I feel like all the horror and evil that black people faced in the country is rooted here. So I was like, fuck the South. I don't want to make a movie in the South. This is him trying to like overcome that, like him trying to be like, OK, I should, you know, step generations back. It's it's like an exorcism for him in a way. It, it really feels yeah. like it. And like. You know, when they're making this movie, they have survivors of the massacre on set who people who are obviously children uh, at the time and now are old people. And like, I think making this movie, you know, they built this big set like, you know, they're they're out in the middle of Florida with the palmettos. And, you know, it, it must have been sort of like weird and ghostly and spine tingly and all that. Like, I think making this movie was this sort of weighty, sort of intense experience for all of them. Uh, it sounds very interesting. Just, just, to, just to have the people there being like that sounds right, or like that yeah. makes sense, or that looks it. to recreate uh, something like this is is you know the, the Greg Poirier who the, is the screenwriter and Can we, let's you know, talk about this him, quickly. We have to we have to up, we have to talk about this filmography quickly because I can't <laughs> fucking figure it out. This is my, the, my best guess. Go ahead. For some reason, at some point, someone else had tried to write a movie about this. When he went to Warner Brothers, they had this script. Singleton no. took it. it wrong? That no, was no, my no. guess. Greg, okay, no. wow. So so the reason Griffin is freaking out is that the guy who wrote this movie is like his. the rest of his um, Hollywood screenplays are mostly like trash, like he wrote me, and directed Tomcats. Yeah, That's his I'm only sorry. directorial effort. But let me just uh, truly ahead, just ahead. burn through these, okay? The yes. the series of things that he does before Rosewood, the titles are The Adventures of Dynamo Duck, Danger hey. Zone 3, Steel Horse War, Death hey, Riders. That sounds good. The Strangers, Wild Malibu Weekend Exclamation Point. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. I, yeah, I agree. All of those titles sound good, but they sound like good trash. Okay. Then Rosewood. His credit. And, and look, there are many cases of this where someone is like a serious minded screenwriter. They write some amazing spec script. They get thrown into the system. They write a bunch of trash for years. I mean, it's like when you interviewed um, uh, the Arrival writer. And you were like, this is an interesting yep. pivot for Eric you because Syria. you only yep. Yep. wrote horror before this. And he's like, no, only my horror screenplays got produced before this. Those are the only things I had the credits for. So you're like, maybe this is a serious minded guy who got caught up in genre drunk for a while. No, his next credit is additional written material for The Lion King 2 Simba's Pride. Then he writes Gossip, Sea Spot Run, the David Arquette dog two-hander. He yep. writes and directs Tomcats, <laughs> A Sound of Thunder, which is like a notorious sci-fi flop. He has yes. a story credit on National Treasure Book of Secrets, which is admittedly an American masterpiece. Of course, a great film. But that's a movie with like 14 story credits or whatever. He writes The Spy Next Door, the sort of hey. arguably the nadir of the American Jackie Chan movies. I don't know if you disagree with this, Jamal. It's not a good movie. I, I've, not, I've, not, I've not seen it. I mean, when Billy Ray Cyrus is second build in your movie. Yes. Ooh, yeah. 
And then uh, what is I mean, he, his most recent credit is like a uh, a Ukrainian animated film called yeah, the, A Warrior's on, Tale. Yeah, he also worked on the Ashley Judd TV show Missing. Look, I don't know how it is that this converged, but yeah. when the when he's writing this movie, the LA Times inter- interviews him. He he is it mentioned as a theater guy, and in brackets it says this is his first major screenplay. So I'm assuming you know. Wild Malibu Weekend and Danger Zone Rude. Three or whatever, like that—that's that, yeah. that's money. Uh, you know, those are our sure. jobs for money, I, I guess. And he is someone who interviewed like Rosewood survivors, and you know, found a two hundred page report by commissioned by the Florida Legislature. You know, he he is whatever. He is the guy that John Singleton is working with to excavate all the history and he's on set and stuff. So it's also it's, odd. That's just a weird thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, and look, uh, there are many cases in which a director is very hands on and doesn't get a, a co-writing credit. But it's also just interesting because Singleton was the sole writer on his first three films. Uh, Yeah. I mean, he certainly wrote all those movies. I'm trying to remember if he had a co-writer on any of them. No. Yeah. No, he's the sole right. Yeah, look, I mean, I I assume Rosewood. He's also not a producer on, which he had been on his other movies. Yeah, this movie is produced by Jormo, please, uh, John Peters. Yes, uh, the famous <laughs> uh, psychopath who ran uh, which studio was it uh, for what Sony? So he ran you know yes. Columbia for a couple yes. of years. He was yeah. Barbara Streisand's hairdresser. He famously demanded to put metal spiders into Superman blah, blah, movies West. for many years. Well, and, and then finally got blah, blah, it. Yes, West. right. Uh, he's crazy. Uh, what's his recent thing? I feel like he has a recent thing. Oh, he was like going to make a Sandman movie, right? And he was like, but my Sandman fucks or whatever. You know, he, he was going to mess up the Sandman at one point. I he don't know. He also announced that he was going to release a book. He had written it and like Hollywood just fucking shook him down, was like, do not fucking publish this. You will burn down the entire town with you. Um, but, 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 yes. Uh, interesting things to talk about. I mean, Jamel, you mentioned this, and it's very much in all the interviews we're reading for each of these movies, each of these episodes we do. Singleton was so aware and sort of defensive about getting pigeonholed as a director, right? Especially because he's so fucking young. He comes out of nowhere so hard and hits so big with Boys in the Hood. And it does spawn this kind of subgenre for for years. Higher learning and uh, poetic justice are both pivots. I mean, it's like poetic justice is a fascinating follow up movie to me because it feels like him pushing off his blank check cash in for a movie or two. Right. He's like, I'm going to make something pretty small and modest in an, its ambition. I'm going to scale down from Boys in the Hood. And it's very much like, let me make the counterpart film. Let me do the female perspective. Let me try to get more romantic, you know, but it's not him cashing in all the chips. And it does. OK. And then he does Higher Learning, which is like his big sort of messy, ambitious, primal scream Altman movie kind of thing. Right. And then he does this. And Rosewood and Higher Learning both feel more like the film you make after you become the youngest person ever to be nominated for Best Director. But he sort of like extended his blank check aura by not cashing it in immediately. But those first three movies are Columbia. Stephanie Allen was the person who really shepherded him. And you wonder if it's just like, okay, well, you made two more films and neither of them totally hit, right? They just, you, you've now had three bites at the apple. Only one of your films really grabbed hold of the culture. Are you sort of like, was that a one-off fluke? You know, are, are you in a sort of Altman way where they like gave him a, a longer run because he was a white man of, of like the seventies where them being like, you got to be able to make mash again. Right. And then by the, like, Popeye, they were like, fuck it. He can't. He can't do it. I don't understand why that one movie, he was able to make something that the audiences liked, but the guy can't fucking do it. But he's still obviously a respected enough person and enough of Nam that someone like Warner Brothers, if, if Columbia sort of goes cold on him, other studios are going to be fighting to see, like, can he recapture it? Can we give him a shot? What if we get him a writer? What if we put someone like John Peters on him, you know? And especially on paper, you're like, yeah, this should be his fucking Schindler's list, I guess. You know, right. if he's coming in and saying, I want to make I'm going to get a John Williams score. I'm going to make my big historical drama. Um, but 
he had thornier ambitions with this movie. Yeah, I mean, it, it's you. You think about the kind of movie that I imagine the studio thought it was going to get. Maybe something more, in, more in line with like a Lee Daniels picture, right? Sort of something that's very maybe like very melodramatic and very maudlin at points. And this isn't that. This is like a thriller. This is more a thriller than it is, it is anything else, um, in my mind. And the historical story here, all that's not uplifting. It's sort of it's like cautionary. <laughs> it's it's yeah. it's uh it, it does not it does not hit the kind of notes that a movie with a John a John Williams score um no. you might have you might imagine hitting. Wild that Williams did the score. Oh yeah, I saw that when that came up on the on the credits at the beginning. I was like, oh, not not anticipating a John Williams score for this one. David. Yes. David. <laughs> What's up? Ah, oh, so much. I I'm sorry. Yeah, I've just you got a few things going on. I got a few things going on. I hope you don't mind if I pause the conversation, get off subject a little bit to just grind a couple axes. Uh huh. Ah, there's just so many things right now making my workouts hard. Oh, you mean like extra resistance? Yeah, things like that. Double, Double speed. speed. The yeah. the pressure to do just one more mile. I mean, these are things I come up against every single day, David. Okay. All right. Well, you, there's nothing you can do about that, unfortunately. No, there um, is no. something I can do something about, though. What What can you do? Get better socks. You can get some Bombas Performance socks because they're built to be nothing but comfortable and supportive. Uh huh. Right. So, yeah. You know, we all like our Bombas comfort socks, the the nice socks you wear around the house. I'm wearing them right now, actually. Look, I'm wearing mm -hmm. them. I'm wearing there them. I'm holding them up to the camera. It's my Oscar the Grouch socks. They're, they've got great Sesame Street socks. Um, and they take those socks. They've added their special Hextech performance technology. So they've got temperature regulating vents. The cool air can come in. They've got a pillow tab that saves you from blisters. They've got an arch hugging system. They've got this cushiony comfort on the bottom. They've got all kinds of stuff going on. David, they got special moisture wicking yarn, for goodness sake. Like all their socks... Uh, for every pair of performance socks that you buy, they donate a pair to someone in need. They've donated over 45 million pairs so far. So, you know, like it's both good for your feet and good for the world. Yeah. And they also were featured on Shark Tank and they're the most successful Shark Tank product of all time. And they never include that in their ad copy because they're you modest. Always, you always slip it in. I have to slip it in much like I always have to slip my foot into a Bombas sock. That's right. And look. I love Bombas. I, it's the only sock I wear now. They're one of the best sponsors of the show. Not that all our sponsors aren't good. But if you go to bombas.com slash check today, you can get 20% off your first order. That's B-O-M-B-A-S. Bombas.com slash check. 20% off. Bombas.com slash check. Thinking about why this movie did not connect with audiences or i mean crit the, the critical response was positive but there did there does seem to have been sort of like uh as you mentioned that at the start of the conversation david kind of like oh yeah this is sort of like yeah this is the yeah. this yeah but i i just uh, and i said this to you over text like i think this may have been received as like a a standard issue race movie but it really isn't at all and i think to to um to go to something I said at the beginning as well, I think maybe one reason that this movie was not was received so lukewarmly is that its message, if it has one, is like a is like a dissection of um, white American masculinity and really connecting right. it to the country's history of racism. One of the one of the subplots of the film is Bruce McGill and his son. And from the start, that subplot is Bruce McGill trying to impress on his son that the way to be a man is to be able to inflict this kind of violence on others. Right. When when they're introduced, he's sort of goosing his son to shoot uh, an animal when they're out hunting. He's like annoyed right. at his son for not pulling the trigger. Yes. And and that is that's like repeat that that's repeated throughout the film, but also you see in so many other ways the way that the way in which uh, sort of camaraderie, connection, a sense of worth, all of these things end up being connected to like the ability to get gather together and like inflict violence on other people. 
And I have to imagine that even if an audience member uh, wasn't unaware of this, like I sort of think that the way in which this movie takes a very jaundiced view of Americans, of white Americans, a very sort of like your your shit stinks kind of view, um, mm-hmm. had to mm-hmm. had to have had to have had an impact on how it was received. Um, especially again, given that this context of kind of like, you know, end of history, self congratulations, right? Like we beat, right. you know, fifty years ago we beat the Nazis. Five years ago we beat the Soviets. You know, it, it's sort of that's. I don't know. This this movie seems to me seems to me to be so much in in dialogue with the kind of general vibe of how mainstream America thought of itself in the nineties. Um, in the same way, you know, I was on the Forrest Gump episode. In the same way that Forrest Gump was also vibing on that as well. Yes, yes. This is another movie that is that is taking that and sort of trying to critique it um, and and push back on it in a way that yeah, it's just I, it's just not going to appeal to people. I, I I'd even go as much to say that if, if this movie came out today, you'd have like a whole there'd have to be like a whole mini culture war cycle about it. Yes, with um yes. with a lot of outrage about its depiction of, of white Americans. I, I'm looking at the, the LA Times article, which people can find, which was uh, written, it was published in June of 96 when they were filming the movie. And in that, they say that the movie is going to come out in the fall. And John Peters go. is talking about uh, how he believes the movie will stir up controversy. And he was trying to organize a 60 minutes episode that was a town hall on the real story to sort of like get that. You just have to imagine when they deliver the cut, Warner Brothers goes like, this is not uplifting. This does not have the sense of triumph. You know, this does not have the sense of, um, you know, what it still comes up when fucking race movies enter the Oscar sphere in a major way. They tend to be films that deal with race relations in a way that uh, keep the audience's hands clean, right? The the white viewers hands clean of, well, look at how bad those people are. I'm not as bad as them. Or this was so far away. Clearly, we've come so far since right. then and this is a movie that does not allow you to sort of absolve yourself of complicity um in in as clean of a way um but that's clearly the, the other interesting thing in this article is that uh peters is the one who kickstarted this project peters saw a story about a survivor on the news and then investigated got their life rights which makes me wonder if he then hired poirier and yeah, that might be true. Right. right. And, and then Singleton eventually. Right. Yeah. Right. They I mean, they might have courted Singleton or Singleton might have independently come to the he wanted to do a Rosewood movie. And Peter's already had one sort of uh, percolating at Warner Brothers. But um, yeah, you can understand how a producer like John Peters, who, to put it nicely, is pretty crass and base yes he's a crass person right (laughs) right just said like this is important there has to be an important holocaust style movie you can make about this story you know just going like well this i hear i see big hit movies that get oscar nominations about tragedies and the strength of the human spirit in the face of them i have to be able to replicate that kind of thing but uh i mean jamel you said before we recorded that one of the only responses you got to your tweets about the movie was from someone saying i never saw that because i always assumed it was a white savior movie and yeah john voight is first build in this right right but it's also uh, not yeah. like the movie was seemingly sold on voight like it does feel like ving rames was the face they were trying to put forward yeah, because Ving Rhames is kind of at the height of his stardom, let's, sort of. Let's do I mean, a little like, Ving we're here. Pretty, yeah. yeah, we can do a little Ving. I mean, we've obviously talked about him, I guess, in Mission Impossible episodes and stuff. But, like, um, yeah, like, obviously, Pulp Fiction is 93, or 94, sorry. Yeah. Um, and post that, okay, he's in Mission Impossible. He's in, of course, David Caruso, Nicolas Cage, Two-Hander, Kiss of Death. Kiss of death. <laughs> Good movie. <laughs> um, he's in uh, strip tease. I feel like all of that. I mean, is is stuff where it's like he's Hollywood is like we've got you 
pegged, you're a supporting character, you're a character actor. Like out of sight. It's, right. It's like that becomes his default thing that's, of like right. right. Post Rosewood, it's right. Con Air. Obviously he wins the Golden Globe for only in you know, playing Don King yeah. on TV. But yeah, out of sight, entrapment, bringing out the dead. He's uh, he's so good in bringing out the dead. That is a hysterical performance. Yeah, it's so he, cool. He would maybe be my supporting actor winner that year. Certainly on the ballot. He's yeah. so fucking great in that movie. But but all supporting. Yes. He's in Baby Boy. He's in, you know, Singleton works with him again. This is kind of the only movie that even, uh, it, let's say this, the only major studio film that even attempts to sort of center him. I'm genuinely trying to think of others. There have to be some, right? I guess Dawn of the Dead, he's kind of a lead, no, but right? Argue, co-lead I mean, with Sarah Polly. He's co-lead, he's yeah. second lead. Polly's very yeah. much the audience surrogate character in yeah. that. And I think part of Ving Rhames' power as a movie star at this point in time is there's some kind of unknowability about him, right? There's something kind of elusive and distant about him. Yeah, yes, that's true. Yes, he's the he's the mystery man who wanders in often or yeah, there's some Right. And and, and there's the conflict in Ving Rhames between his sort of like innate steeliness and a vulnerability, uh, a sensitivity that he cannot entirely hide, right? And something like pulp fiction is like the guy's just high status intimidating until you get to the Z scene, right? But then even just like on a comedy wavelength, it's like the Dave performance is kind of Hollywood's perception of Ving Rhames in a nutshell, which is you spend a whole movie with this guy being like the funny straight man because he's so serious and humorless about everything. And at the end, he has this heartwarming moment where he shows that he cares, right? And it's like a lot of him being the best friend character who comes through at the end in these big Hollywood movies like Luther Strickland, which becomes his like his stock in, you know, but. But this is a very different use of him in a movie, especially because of how centered he is and how the movie is really framing him as like this is if anyone's going to save the day, it's going to be this guy. There's no one else you could turn to. He's not playing assist. Voight, I will say, is almost more interesting because this is when he's coming back. Right. You know, he kind of has a weird in the years before that. Yeah. Right. He has a sort of a weird sabbatical. Then he's back. He's in Heat. He's in Mission Impossible, of course, with Ving Rhames. He's in this and Anaconda and U-Turn and the Rainmaker all in 97. You know, like he's suddenly kind of everywhere. And, you know, we don't have to talk about it too much. But, like, obviously now John Voight is this sort of weird red-pilled Trumpy you know, like he's one of those guys. Well, he has you that know, quote that... that, you know, I'm not yeah. saying he originated, but he he drops it all the time of like when you're young, if you're not a liberal, you don't have a heart. And when you're old, if you're not a conservative, you don't have a brain. He says that all the fucking time because he was such a, a fucking lefty, you know, like radical for so much of his career, not just in who he was as a public figure, but like especially in the roles he played and shit, you know? I mean, even just him taking on a project like this, it's kind of unfathomable with who Voight is today. He would probably be in the exact opposite of this movie. But like him winning the Oscar for coming home and and making a sort of politically radical speech, you know, while wearing a scarf and just being like, you know, America is fucked. And then now he's just like, why is anyone insulting America? Right. It's weird. In this LA Times article, he says like, you know, uh, you know, he has these quotes where I want to find the exact quote, but you know, uh, I feel like we're witnesses, uh, you know, that we've we can't stand in these shoes, but we've chosen to immerse ourselves in this story. Like, you know, he's very serious. That's what I'm saying. Like uh, when he used to go on TV, he would speak that way, you know, and now he does the same thing, but just with lunacy. I don't know. It's just weird. Yeah. Uh, John Voight, just weird. He's he's good in this movie, but his character, as you're kind of saying, Jamal, like, He's not being introduced as like the kind shopkeep. He's being introduced having sex in the back of the store. You know, right. like he, he there's this sort of a, a nastiness, not like extreme, just kind of like a, you know, this is we're we're not like entering his store as viewers and being like, oh, this is sort of like a, a part of the community that's crucial. Like we're kind of entering with this sort of uncomfortable feeling. 
Right. I mean, the, to go back to something you guys said earlier, any a non I'm not even going to say like a, a, a non black filmmaker, because I can uh, I can imagine a black filmmaker making this movie this uh, a different way as well. But any any of the major, you know, historical drama filmmakers of the 90s, if, if this were a Spielberg, if this were a Zemeckis, the Voight character would be they'd sand off all the edges. And have him be much more of an audience surrogate. Mm -hmm. Um, But Singleton presents him as scummy, as venal, um, Mm -hmm. as sort of not really any less racist than anyone else in the town. My, you know, my, my broken brain that reads too much academic stuff, you know, I, I see this kind of character and it's just, it's such an interesting, it's interesting to have him as a shopkeeper which is to say like an owner of capital and property. And he just occupies this place in this town where he is both reliant on the high, the the present hierarchy, right? Sort of like that kind of keeps him um, in his status, but also just, it's kind of in the nature of like market life that there is this tension with the hierarchy as well. Like he, it, it's like he 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 sells bullets to John Don Cheadle's character and also gives them to the mob, right? So right. Like he 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 kind of is his fingers in both pots. And one thing that struck me watching this movie is how much I I really need to actually just like read some reviews from when this came out because I have to imagine that at least some of them are just sort of like the white characters are so cartoonish. But I see this movie as actually having like a lot more tension and and ambiguity about the nature of like white society within the context of the movie. So to go back to Michael Rooker's character, not a great guy. No, he's, he's the playing the sheriff, right? He's playing the sort of, like right. He's the sheriff. sheriff. Yeah. But he's like somewhat resistant to the mob, not because he has any sympathy for, for the denizens of Rosewood, but because he has an interest in maintaining kind of like a monopoly on state violence and sort yeah. of like the mob, letting the mob go, go wild both undermines that and also sort of undermines the social relations of the area that like they actually do need the 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 black rosewoodians to like do labor right <laughs> they need them yeah. there yeah um uh the husband of fanny you know says you shot the woman who cleans my home like there's this there's this there there are labor relations here that have to be preserved that are threatened by the mob violence and creates this tension within even all the with the, within the racist mob, um, which is like an interesting. It's, it's like a the thing about this movie that so stands out to me is how how like legitimately nuanced it is about all of these things, despite kind of portraying a not particularly nuanced story, like in the broad strokes of it. And that you could have made this movie in a way that completely flattens out all these internal tensions and contradictions. Uh, and I kind of think it would have done better. I kind of think this yeah. movie is like flaw in terms of its like popular appeal is precisely that it's like operating on a lot of interesting levels that um, that are challenging and like yes. aren't the kind of thing you see in this kind of movie to contrast it with Amistad again. Like Amistad is very straightforward. There's like not really there's not really that much to say about Amistad as a movie besides like you know all the tropes all like the white savior tropes like the talk about Amos has to talk about all the ways in which it's flawed but like actually the movie itself is pretty straightforward and offers either a, a portrait of like black suffering or like white heroism and that's kind of that, that's kind of how it how it goes and rosewood um rosewood just takes a much more nuanced view of sort of all everyone involved in all of this uh, yes. which is something I gotta say. I gotta say I wasn't expecting when I when I when I turned this on um, uh, Sunday nights when we started it. Like I wasn't actually, I didn't have the strongest memory of it, and so I just like was expecting something more like a '90s historical drama um, versus something that feels like it was written by an academic in part. Right. I think a lot of these types of movies are trying to frame these stories in a way where it's like, and here's how we fixed it. 
or at least here's how we yes. took the first step towards fixing it, and you that, as the right. audience get to feel the like, and now things are good. That sort of like remove the disconnect, the arm's length that helps make these movies become Oscar favorites and and commercial breakthroughs and what have you. And this movie is so much more interested in why these things happen in the first yeah. place, which is you know a thing that is very uncomfortable to watch. Um, it, it, he's interested in the sort of like domino effect of all this stuff and, and the breaking points of these tensions, you know, which it's like a big part of this movie is these guys, the white people in this town were clearly just waiting for an excuse, you know? It, it, the quickness with which it escalates, the degree to which it does. There's that scene I love when Lauren Dean goes back to his wife and mentions that um, uh, Esther Raleigh's character has been shot. And she yeah. just sort of starts losing it and going like, what do you mean? But she didn't do anything. Why would they shoot her? And it's like, well, this is the woman who started the whole thing. And she was, and this is the other major theme I think he's really interested with in, which is a very raw nerve for people to deal with, which is the incredibly, the incredibly short walk between uh, uh, sexual guilt and shame and most forms of bigotry. You know, and it's Definitely. things we see even just, you know, it, it happened fairly recently at the time we're recording this, but the the series of uh, the uh, massage parlor shootings, you know, but even just I will sometimes play that fucking game on Twitter of seeing a person who openly just uses slurs in in their main feed, goes into people's fucking at replies and just starts throwing slurs around. And then you click on that account and you click on their likes or their at tweets. And it is almost always predominantly cam girls of the group Porn. that they are yeah. using the slurs against, right? There's just this incredible sort of shame. And this movie is all about the inciting incident is the notion of a, a sexual encounter, uh, you know? Uh, not to mention that the the Voight character, that's sort of his main framing in his introduction and what makes him so conflicted as a character is you you sort of get the sense that it's like he probably would be a great a greater ally did he not feel the need to overcompensate for his shame about the fact that he's having this affair with a black woman. And when the people are coming to him for some sanctuary uh, in the town, he wants to push them away and it is his wife who's like, what the fuck? Bring them in, you know? But he's sort of overcorrecting for, I feel shame by the fact that I'm cheating on my wife. That this is not the person I'm really attracted to. I need to go harder in denying the the outreach to them. Along those lines, I mean, so the the the, the inciting incident, Fanny um, is, uh, I guess she has like, she sleeps with other men when her husband's working i guess she just like cucks her husband routinely and uh uh robert was it robert patrick is that who that was it's robert patrick it, robert uh, patrick credited as fanny's lover he's just yeah. in yeah. and out as yeah, as lover. this sort of like mystery villain yes yeah my wife was like is that is that is that a terminator it's like, again yeah, that's, that's <laughs> <a> t1000 <laughs> yeah. he, he melts in and melts away the framing of that scene is interesting because they hold off for so long on letting you see who the guy is. Not just throughout the entire actual act. You're not seeing him. You're not seeing anything identifiable. But even post-coitus when he's dressing, redressing, they really hold off on giving you a look at the guy. So you don't know who it is, right? You get the sense because you're introduced with the photo – uh, on the mantle of her and her husband, this probably isn't her husband. But but you also kind of don't know, like, is this a white guy? Is this a character we already know? Who is this uh, that she's having such energetic sex with? But I'm sorry, uh, Jamal, you were about to say it. No, so uh, just building off your point about sexual shame. So uh, that's, he, he uh, they have sex, he beats her afterwards, and then she goes out into the street and she screams that it was a, a black guy who assaulted her, didn't rape her, but assaulted her. Um, although in the in the word of mouth, this becomes like she was raped. Yeah, she actually makes it clear I wasn't raped, but right. that means nothing. Right. Uh, 
and later, Michael Rooker says to her husband, his character, we all know what happens in your home when you're not home. Like, it's not, it's not a big secret here. And there's this way in which that the, uh, the the if violence inflicted on Rosewood is itself a manifestation of the shame, right? Yeah. So everyone knows that this woman who is, a, who is a white woman who is supposed to be sort of like more innocent or pure in whatever way is not. And so rather than deal with that, we're just going to kill a bunch Burn of other town people to the ground. Right. And, bla- and, bla- yeah. and, bla- and, bla- and blame them for our own dysfunction. I mean, I I could not stop thinking during this movie about the Capitol riots in January because it was the same kind of thing where it's like there is this blatant fallacy that is being perpetuated as this is your excuse, the reason why you need to storm the Capitol, you know? I mean, what what people call the big lie, and it's just like it doesn't hold up under any scrutiny, but people were looking for an excuse to be told it is not only okay, but you have a moral obligation to fucking get violent and and stomp your way stomp your way in there, you know, and it's the same kind of thing where it's like no one actually really seems to believe this. It's maybe my favorite moment in the movie. I mean, Esther Raleigh's so fucking good in this thing overall, but that's there are so many witnesses to the violence, right? To Robert Patrick leaving. It is seen. And she doesn't say anything for a while. As this game of telephone heightens. And not only is this myth perpetuated and spread, but it's also now amped up to, oh, it was rape. It wasn't just a beating, right? And she is doing anything she can to not have to deal with the consequences of, I'm cheating on my husband. Yes, Lauren Lauren Dean is her husband. Right, right. I can villainize an anonymous black man. And that way I will be absolved of any wrongdoing in this situation. This is a common enemy that the white citizens of this town will all be able to get behind, which unfortunately lines up with a mysterious Ving Rhames cowboy character coming into town, which gives them an easy scapegoat, right? But the scene where they're in the church and Voight is there and she asks him to leave before she can spread the information that I saw the guy, he was white. The guy's white. Yeah. And A, she's not saying it as, look, here's our play. We have to spread the word that he's white. She's saying it as, look, it doesn't fucking matter because it's not like, you know, whether or not they believe this is is the root of the thing. But you should all know the guy was white. And that she fundamentally doesn't trust Voight to have that information, you know? Um, I think not because it's a secret but because to some degree it's like i don't want to give him the power to deny it or give him the power to act like i'm going to be the hero go back to everyone say do you know it was a white guy and have them ignore it you know it's it's just sort of a temperature setting thing for her of like we should just know that this is bullshit Anyway, we're fucked. David. Yep. David. Yep. Hello. Uh, hello. Oh, fresh. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hello, fresh. I don't know. I'm tired. Yeah, me too. Hey, you no kidding. Me too. I need to eat something. You need to eat something. And maybe you want to get dinner on the table in like 30 minutes or less. Would love that. Would love that. maybe you don't want to go to the grocery store. Maybe you want to cut out the stressful meal planning. Maybe you just want to get a meal that you could cook in 20 minutes with lightning prep recipes. You Maybe a quick breakfast. Maybe a lunch. Maybe you want to choose from over 25 recipes each week. So it's, you know... There's a little bit of variety, something for everyone to enjoy. David, you are so lucky because if you had said that they only had 24 recipes, I was going to be out on this offer. But you're telling me they have over 25 recipes? Yes. Jack Bauer is blushing because HelloFresh has a wide variety of easy, delicious options for all three meals a day, plus every snack and special treat in between. They've got fresh ingredients. They source them directly from growers. Not showers. right, Right from the... Exactly. They deliver them right from the farm to your front door in under a week, contact-free. No 
Jody Foster or Matthew McConaughey. Sure. Uh, and it's 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store, 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal without sacrificing the quality. They're good. good fellow, you know, they're, they're the best meal kits. They're, they're really, really easy to use and they taste nice. Uh, hold on. I just want to try to make one more joke about one of the details. Um, uh, Hello Fresh is uh, 28% uh, cheaper. If Danny Boyle directed it, it'd be called 28% later. <laughs> Yeah, look, maybe he will. You don't know. Maybe they'll tie into 28 Days Later. HelloFresh will save the world somehow. 20, 28% later. Look, you can, we can work on that all night. I have to tell you now that if you go to HelloFresh.com slash BlankCheck12 and use code BlankCheck12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping, then you'll be happy. That's what I'm going to tell you. Yeah, you and, and what about this? What about this, David? What if you're listening to this ad right now and you're thinking, oh, but you know what? This is a conflict of interest. In the past, Blank Check has advertised Green Chef, and I like Green Chef, and that's the meal, meal kit delivery service I like. Well, great news, okay? Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh. Yeah, they got a wider array of meal plans for the for, because of it, so it's great. I love switching between the brands. It's my favorite thing to do. I do it every night. Okay, but listen, if you just have to, I just have to repeat this. Go to HelloFresh.com slash BlankCheck12 and use code BlankCheck12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. And that's that. That's what you should do if you want to enjoy both brands at a discount with me. I do. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Fresh. We're not really doing the plot of this movie because it's actually a simple plot in a way because the yeah. first chunk of it is really just sort of like, Community feeling, and it's, you know, you're it's a disaster movie, the town. right? Right, things are being building up. John Storms are brewing. Bing Rames, Bing yep. Rames, and John Foy. You know, um, and then yes, there's this this incident with Robert Patrick where you're like, wait, who are these? You barely know who these people are. You barely know who Lauren Dean is. It's really, as you say, Jamel. It's just like, yeah, well, his wife just is, sleeps with other men, and like his, her her lover beats her. She blames it on a sort of you know phantom black person, mm -hmm. and that's it that's the that's the sort of torch to the kindling and everything just disintegrates from there but as you say aunt sarah esther Rowley, like the the sort of a, a pretty beloved figure in both the towns of rosewood and sumner like you know this she, as she said she delivered a lot of the people who end up burning her town to the ground, right? Like she's also, certainly, yeah. no one bears ill will towards her. And and strategic casting a beloved figure in American homes, right? Absolutely. I mean, you have yeah. like, right, this like quintessential sitcom matriarch. Right, the, 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 the sort of the, the um, classic mom character, exactly from Good Times and just a great actress and, as you say, like the, the character of Fanny is very upset to learn that she's dead, but she is also she's a she's upset like it's like oh that you know that like 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 someone knocked you know something over you know like like it's just this sort of like well how could that have happened like what the fuck you know right. she's not I don't know like you know she, it's, she makes no it's effort still to then yeah. correct I mean that's the other right. thing she continues to go like I I am hurt upset angered by her death but also if i own up i'm gonna be in trouble like i continue to be willing to put black bodies in front of my uh consequence and not to bring up amistad again but amistad is a movie in which uh people of power debate the moral weight and consequence of slavery in like the supreme court that is the that is the essence of that movie whereas this movie is just this movie set a hundred years later basically and is about like it, it literally takes some bullshit like it, it just takes like one it takes thing nothing. right it's, and it's this, yes. as you've been talking about jamel this sort of simmering egotism and uh you know uh self-consciousness what's the word i'm looking for you know the just just this um what did you jamel the thing you were saying about basically like the discrepancy between what I think I'm owed and how my oh, life yeah, actually yeah. is is like a poor person in the Florida, poor white person in the Florida panhandle just exploding. And it's like, and the town was wiped off the map. And the consequence was nothing. The consequence was 
those who survived got out alive, maybe, and that was it. And, you know, maybe there was a newspaper article written, and that was it. And also, white these white people were willing to burn their own town down. Not just the homes of the black people, but just wipe out their entire town just to make sure that things didn't even up more. You know? They're, they're yeah. sort of cutting their nose to spite their face. I want to throw out a theory. Okay, what's your theory? If this movie has a major failing, I think it's Cheadle. I think it's both his performance and this character not working necessarily in the way they need to for the movie to become completely overpowering in a good way. And the, I the Cheadle. love Cheadle. I, I, Obviously, I love Don Cheadle. Yeah. Uh, Jamel, I'm assuming you're probably a Don Cheadle fan. I don't want to paint you into a corner here, but, you know, he's a good <laughs> big, actor. Big Don you are an, fan. He's you're great. an American, right? You right. know, right. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. this, this movie is two years after Devil in a Blue Dress, which was his breakout. And I feel like it's, you know, he's in Boogie Nights this year. He's in Out of Sight the next year, right? This is when Don yes. Cheadle is starting yeah. to pop up in lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's playing Sylvester. He's kind of a co what, you know, in the beginning of the movie, you're like, Oh, this is sort of the third lead. That's what I was going to say. Cause that's the other disaster movie thing is very often you start with three key pillars, right? Like in disaster movies, you're cutting between a couple different storylines, but you got three central kind of right, protagonists. Right. And then the movie is the, the things start to converge as disaster strikes. And he's very much set up as the third and then sort of taken off the board for a while so they can fake out his death and have him come back at the end. Yeah, you think he's dead uh, because they say he's dead and because his house gets burned down and his, uh, you know, uh, Aunt Sarah gets killed. And like he's, like like you say, Jamel, he's sort of like one of the more prosperous people in Rosewood, right? He has a piano, right? Like he's got this sort of nice household. He's got a great mustache. Um, he's got a great mustache. And he's dead, and you're like, oh, I guess he's dead, and I guess this is just the senselessness of this movie is that he's gone. We don't even see him go. Like, that was Don Cheadle. That was one of the bigger stars in the movie, and he's gone. And then he's back at the end, and I feel, I do agree that I don't think the movie really lands that he's back. You're like, oh, okay. Uh, and yeah, maybe there's just 10 minutes there that we're, we kind of need, like, to sort of invest us in him more, or I don't know. I mean, this is my thought, okay? I was right before he reemerged thinking to myself, oh, I guess Don Cheadle died, right? I guess, as you said, that's the point the movie made, the senselessness. He's taken off the board so quickly, so unceremoniously, uh, right? And then he comes back in, and I immediately, as much as it's like, I'm very happy Don Cheadle is revealed to be alive in any movie. I'm very happy any movie reveals to me that they have more Cheadle to give. I did then feel the sense of like oh if the character was gonna make it through the movie though i wish he had just been on screen for that time uh i i don't think the movie gains anything really from um withholding cheetle from us and i also feel like just in its construction he should kind of ostensibly be the audience surrogate character he kind of makes sense with the way this film is set up to be the person who's guiding us through the story as much as anyone, because the Ving Rhames character, as we said, is a mystery, is kind of unknowable, right? And the Voight character is not, you know, in, in a good way, a white savior character, as someone who's going through the arc of realizing his wrongs. The Cheadle character is kind of the man on the ground, you know, he is the person right. who is, you know, most uh, victim to this, or at least representationally. Um, it does feel like he's the guy we should be seeing this through. Taking him off the board for that long a chunk of the movie, I don't think does it any favors. I also want to throw out, I think Cheadle is good in the movie, but he is not great. And he is most often great. He doesn't have a lot of meat. He doesn't Just love me. Sort of, it's it's yeah, also an underwritten character, character. I think it's an underwritten character. I also want to throw out, are accents Don Cheadle's Achilles heel? 
I mean, you're talking about Ocean's Eleven. Right, which is just notoriously yeah. one of the worst accents ever. And you kind of have to love how bad the accent is. And it fits into, uh, you know, the fun of that movie. And obviously, he's great in Hotel Rwanda. It's not like he has never pulled off an accent. But this accent is similarly kind of dodgy. I, 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 every moment he speaks on screen, I go, oh, it's Cheadle playing Southern rather than actually buying him as a Southern man. Jamel, as, as a Southerner, I want you to weigh in as well. <laughs> I, I honestly, I, Don Cheadle is the kind of movie star where I actually don't really buy him not being just Don Cheadle. So it doesn't really yeah. distract mm. for me. It's sort of like, oh yeah, this is Don Cheadle in this movie. So he doesn't really sound like someone from the area, but eh, who cares, whatever. It's, it's Don Cheadle. I wanted to agree with you, Griffin, about how he he probably should have been the audience surrogate character, not just because he seemed more representative, but because he's the one character who seems to have a connection to everyone else yes. in the story, right? right? Like he has a connection to Boyd's character through his cousin. Uh, he has a connection uh, to, and we should talk about her, the who the woman who's the female lead, I, I suppose. Um, uh, yeah, yes. uh, Scrappy, Scrap, Scrapple. Scrappy, Scrappy. Scrappy, Scrappy uh, uh, Scrappy. Elise Neal is the actress who yeah. I I mean, she. I, I, I guess she's in Mission to Mars. She's in Scream Two. She was sort of around. She's in Hustle and Flow. I don't know her that well. Yeah, she was on the Hughleys for. Yes, yeah, she was uh, on the Hughleys. That's right. Yeah. Yes, she's the 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 female lead, right? She's the white. Right. Yeah. Um, but and then and then Cheadle uh, Sylvester seems to be known among the white residents of Sumner. Uh, you know, as they they don't like him, but like they know who he is, and so that kind of. That that level of connection to everyone renders him um, a good choice for audience surrogate. I kind of wonder if the scene of him coming back was sort of added late mm. because it does come out of nowhere, and it, it the purpose it seems to serve is basically to give you the audience a little bit of a little bit of triumph. Like the movie ends on a note of relief, like "Oh God, they got out," <laughs> right? But not so much like a note of like anything is good happening here. Um, and so having having Sylvester return at least gives the audience a little more to grab onto in terms of like coming out of the movie not feeling like trash. Yeah, I mean, I also I I keep on going back to my my fucking disaster movie thing here, but um. I, I I kept thinking about uh, uh, Day After Tomorrow, which has that kind of inexplicable set piece that is Jake Gyllenhaal and his friends fight the wolves. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Right. Everyone forgets about that. And, uh, except yeah, for bad sequence. my friend Alex Pearl and I, who never stopped talking about the wolf sequence in Day After Tomorrow, were obsessed with it. And I always say, like, well, because I think they just realized they had backed themselves into a screenwriting corner where they have a an antagonist that cannot be defeated right like the movie is about <laughs> fucking global warming there's no way for them to stop it and ultimately the movie lands at a point of like things seem to have settled down for now because there's nothing they can do to reverse the the threat so it's like Roland Emmerich was just like, let's just have 10 minutes where there's a thing they can actually stop. They can beat wolves. They can run away from wolves. Wolves can be defeated. And then there'll be more rain and snow and shit, right? And eventually we'll just go like, it's been four days. Things are calming down now. The weather's subsiding. And it, it the movie gets itself to this point where like the train becomes the thing, right? It's like, okay, if we can get a couple people out on this train, it will feel like there is some kind of win in this movie and then tied to that is ving rames is going to get a shotgun and he's going to be able to take some names right like th this this small win of he's going to get some survivors out of here and he's also going to get some revenge at the same time and the cheetle re-entrance feels part of that of just like well now the movie is giving you some fucking hollywood hoorah uh, victory there's a little bit of triumph but um it does feel, I don't know, it almost feels a little bit like uh, Tom Cruise's son surviving in War of the Worlds. The, the most irritating creative decision of all time. Of, 
that movie, yes, right. and possibly of all time. Yes. Right, and then uh, there's the moment I actually really like when Ving Rhames is like, how did you make it out? And Don Cheadle says, like, in my mother's coffin. They carried me out. Yeah. Right, or his father's coffin, whatever uh, it was. But, like, there's a moment of, of true uh, solemn terror there. And it's like he survived by the most absolutely traumatic escape hatch possible. Uh, can I can I throw out a couple quotes from this L.A. Times piece that I find very interesting? Yes. Um, so it, 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 they don't fill in all the gaps here, but it does seem like perhaps Peters courted Singleton, right? Um, he had had gotten the life rights, had started looking into this story. Singleton uh, goes to Florida to meet with, as they put it, a dozen or so elderly survivors, right, who kind of start to guide him through this. And uh, uh, one of them tells him, son, you were chosen to do this movie by God, so don't try to take anything from it or add a whole lot to it. Just do the movie. It'll take care of itself. And then this piece, it says, Singleton lowers his eyes and exhales at the memory of that moment. I just took a deep breath, he says. I was proud about it. After meeting the survivors, it was a lock. I definitely wanted to make the movie. Makes sense. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, John Peters' main executive, Tracy Barone, says, um, I think that cemented something in him that was greater than just the telling of this movie. It was a commitment to these people. Um, and he sort of talks about where's the last line in this. Um, uh, the volume of his voice doesn't ride, but his intensity does. I think maybe the movie will bear the brunt of a lot of people, like the people around here who will say, why are you bringing that up? Why are you talking about this? But why not? If you don't talk about it, then it could happen again and again and again. It's more than why not. It's like the Holocaust because you can never forget. Um, and that's sort of the root of the whole thing, but you're getting back to Jamel is just like, it's like him making a movie about the Holocaust if the Holocaust was sort of an urban legend. Right. <laughs> right. 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 That it's, wasn't, it's... that wasn't in history books. Right. Only the people who it happened to and their kids like even know about. Right. Right. So it's like, you know, it's not just a movie like Shoah that is like, this has to be discussed. We have to give voice to these survivors and make sure in detail. It's like, he's like, I, I want people to know just from the start that this happened in any form and that this is not an isolated incident. I mean, to to make, maybe even make it a little more of a, pro, more, a little more provocative analogy. It's like making a movie about the Holocaust in a, in a, in a, in a Germany where the Nazis won. Yeah. Kind of, right, yeah, right, right. yeah, right. Yeah. And that's the other thing he keeps saying in this piece is just like, I, I'm making this movie because this is the America. Like, I'm not, this isn't a triumph of look at how bad things used to be. I'm making a movie about the world that we're still living in. Like, he essentially keeps saying to this reporter, like, same shit, different day. Uh, right. Yeah. The fact that this did not do well because I guess at the, at the start, there's the the truly you know disturbing thing about the Rosewood Massacre is that it's not an especially unique episode. It's it's actually it's like one of it's one of many. There were there were quite a few towns or villages that were you know abandoned or razed to the ground in these sort of like you know these spasms of racial violence. Um, Obviously, you know, there's the there's the whole lynching era where something like 3000 people were killed over the course of 40 years and these sort of often big collective spectacle killings. And so it's not it's not as if it's not as if there aren't more stories here to tell. Right. If you wanted there, are, there are many movies about the Holocaust. There are many different kind of stories to tell about the Holocaust. You could tell many kind of stories about this sort of period. But um they are they're they're different they're emotionally difficult stories to tell they essentially kind of indict there's no way to tell them if you're not going to do kind of a triumphant you know look how we've gotten look how far we've gotten but if you're going to tell a, even even for a movie like Rosewood which has these basically fantastical elements a more grounded story there's sort of no way to do it in a way that makes people feel good 
because because no every way you do it is going to indict the country or it's going to indict the viewer in some way because well, um, the largest message this film is making is we don't tell these stories we don't want to think about this the, the act of watching this film in and of itself is an acknowledgement of the ignorance of the blind spot right of the refusal to um uh, grapple with the past in, in a way that that's not a fucking thing with Holocaust movies. Like, it's just not. And I say this as, like, a Jew who has lived his entire life with an overwhelming fear of, like, from the scars of the Holocaust, you know? But it's not a thing that is ever gone from the, the global psyche. As much as you have pushback to it, Holocaust denial is still a form of acknowledgement, you know? Because it's discussing the thing. Versus these events, which don't get discussed. It's not even that they're pushed back against. And I mean, I feel like so much of like the ending uh, is the thesis of the movie is proven in the way he uses the it's, and inner titles, which like, you know, the, the fucking end coda uh, text is is like, I feel one of those things in historical films that are almost immediately an eye roll, right? Where you just go like. It, it almost always feels like it's hammering home a point that was already clear and now makes it feel kind of blunted or is sort of trying to reframe something with some kind of uplift. It, you know, if you weren't telling us this in the movie, then, uh, you know, it's a failing that you have to give us fucking five blocks of text at the end. But the end text here is so telling, which is the official death toll of the Rosewood Massacre, according to the state of Florida, is eight dot 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 two whites and six blacks the survivors a handful of whom are still alive today place the number anywhere between 40 and 150 nearly all of them african-american so like he's using the end titles to say like this is me making a movie about a story that is so undiscussed that like the the accounting of it as limited as it is is so blatantly bullshit you right, know, in me right. doing my research for the movie, you know, talking to 10 eyewitnesses completely negates everything about the limited ways in which this is ever discussed. I'll say, you know, so much of the well, in talking about sort of the audience perception, we've talked about white viewers. But I also think I, I and I, I wonder because this is a, a dynamic in the present, what whether there were any tensions with black viewers right between this sort of exhuming history aspect, but also sort of not wanting to see yourself as a victim on screen and not wanting to be placed in that kind of context. So that's often, I mean, that's often the context in which black history stories are told. You see kind of like black people get the shit kicked out of them uh, and then hope that there's like a good resolution. And I sort of wonder if that, if that dynamic played against the movie as well. And and speaking to that, like, you know, the, as we've been saying, Ving Rhames' characters, you can think of it as more or less a response to that, like an, an attempt to sort of head that off by giving you a uh, self-assured, um, uh, forward-moving character who is, who is not, violence is not being inflicted on him, he's inflicting it on others. Uh, can I say real quick just about Bing Ramjet's characters? We haven't talked about the scene. The scene where he escapes the noose is like, it's a great scene. It's very funny when they mm -hmm. turn around uh, and he's like gone. Um, but also speaks to sort of like the essentially magical nature of his character that yep. like he, he is strong enough and smart enough uh, and resourceful enough to even having been lynched can escape that. Um, and, and, uh, not just escape it, but still return as the hero. Can, can I say a thing that might sound stupid, but I, I do kind of feel this strongly. Yeah. Knowing that Peters is the one who got the ball rolling on this movie, right? And that so much of this LA Times piece is him being like, I really think people should know this story. I'm really interested in the history of this thing. And that two years later, he makes Wild Wild West. Where sure. the Will Smith, Jim West character is kind of positioned somewhat similarly to man in this film. And there's that incredibly tone deaf, disastrous opening sequence in Wild Wild West that is like Jim West escaping a noose, 
right? That he is sort of this like magical, liberated, confident, modern black man in uh, a, a, a backward South. It does feel like that much like Peter's uh, trying to get a giant mechanical spider in there somewhere <laughs> that he was kind of really into this character and was trying to find another way to make it work. I would buy that. That sounds, right? that sounds totally plausible. Listen, we just 100% I, we got to have in the movie at least one scene where a right. black guy almost gets lynched. It's just that scene sticks out so hard. I feel like when people talk about that movie and what a disaster it was after so much hype, they're always like, and then five minutes into the movie, that scene happens and it just stops you cold in its tracks, right? I do feel like maybe Peters comes away from this as sort of a dumb guy and goes like, we just need to do the movie where it's not the historical shit and it's just this guy being a badass vigilante. I also just want to point out, I mean, the other uh, uh, title card before the one I read is about the fact that they finally uh, uh, were able to grant reparations through the Florida House yes. of Representatives 70 years after the massacre, 1993, so only four years before this movie is released, three years before it's filmed. Um, and that that was only done because of the testimony of survivors who were children at the time, uh, you know, presumably mostly the same survivors that Singleton talked to and that, that Peters got the life rights from. Um, and, and pointedly, one white citizen who testified on behalf of the victims. And he capitalizes white, and it really feels like that's like the final hammer drop he's doing at the end of this movie, which is just like, I just want to make it clear, 70 years later, there was only one white person who came to validate the account. And perhaps, you know, as as depressing as it is that there was only one, also perhaps the fact that there was one is the only reason why the reparations even got passed in the first place. So the question in the comment, the question is, so the title card said, um, or the inner title said it was the Florida House of Representatives. Do we know if this was actually, because like to pass a bill, you still need the upper house and then the governor to sign. And so was was it just the Florida House did or, or was it an actual um, did it actually go through the whole process and, and become a law passed? Um, uh, they, they I can tell you, they basically the legislature, the first and the, this is not going to be the most. Um, you're not going to be thrilled to hear this. I will say Lawton Childs <laughs> was was governor of Florida at the time, a Democrat. Um who was a sort of longtime senator and then became the governor of Florida. Um, when this all gets, it was, the, I believe, one of the first U.S. states to ever consider compensation for racial violence, this, this whole uh, thing that happened in the 90s. They had testimony, you know, they had hearings. Uh, they said there's a moral obligation. There was some kind of... Uh, wedge thing that happened, you know, like black legislatures refused to support a healthcare plan, you know, until this bill got voted on, you know, like there was like a political maneuvering to get this thing attention. And they wanted to offer 7 million. They settled on 1.5 million, uh, which is something, obviously it ended up being about 150,000 for every person who could prove that they lived in Rosewood during 1923 and 500,000 for ancestors of the people who lived in Rosewood. Um, I'm doing a bit of a shrug, but you know, it was, <laughs> I guess, something like, I guess there was at least the sort of official government acknowledgement of it. But when you see that initial 7 million number and then the compromise 1.5 million, I think there's a bit of a, you know, that sort of tells the story right there. Yeah. So my, my comment, my additional comment is that you know, in the, in the, a couple years after this, uh, Oklahoma had a similar kind of process, a commission. Um, yes, a, for Tulsa. Uh, yeah, for Tulsa. And they couldn't get the reparations part of it through. And then North Carolina had a similar kind of commission around the forced sterilization of African Americans in kind of the middle of the 20th century. And that the reparations part didn't happen there as well. So it is, I mean, this does make this sort of unique in terms of um, compensation happening and also the fact that i can quickly off the top of head identify two uh, additional such commissions is i think you know just more to emphasize how not especially 
atypical these kinds of events were. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. With that said, should we play the box office game? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sounds right. Drum roll. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I feel so bad that this this this, this is a this is a pretty relatively serious conversation. Uh, when I, my usual vibe yeah. is like, I know, I mean, I know I'm sort of like serious columnist guy, but like my usual vibe is not not so serious about about this about movies. Right. I feel Jamel. I feel like your next appearance should be. I mean, obviously the Spider Man three episode. I know, you know, I know you're circling that. Oh yeah, one yeah. I'm, that I'm, comes I'm, around. Yeah, yeah. I'm like I'm America's <laughs> foremost Spider Man three. Fan. <laughs> But yeah, you you should you should get a, a less sobering movie. Next <laughs> but but also look, uh, uh, Jamal, thank you uh, uh, because uh, I mean we would have I feel like had an Amistad episode on our hands if we tried to tackle this alone, you know. Um, sure. And yeah. and you uh, just do have one of the best brains on the planet for putting things in perspective. Uh, with regards to American history, I find. Um, so, so thank you for uh, for wanting to do this episode. Uh, thank you. And look, number it opened. O Rose would open number eight at the box office, Griffin, on February twenty first, nineteen ninety seven. Okay, it opened okay. to three million dollars. It made ten. Okay, uh, so sorry, thirteen. So it it opened to less than the reparations that were asked for, but more than what was actually given. True. That is true. Um, it was out of theaters. I don't know. After a couple of months. Yeah. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was dumped, I would say not maybe unceremoniously, yeah. but ceremoniously dumped. Yeah. And here's the thing. What was the number one movie at the box office that week? Griffin, I'm going to tell you it's new this week, quote unquote new, uh, but it is a re-release. I know what it is. It's Empire Strikes Back. It's Star Wars. The Empire, the Empire Strikes Back. I wish you hadn't given me the additional five. clues. I knew it immediately. I was just thinking about last night, January, February, March, New Hope, Empire, Return of the Jedi. Just still, it just, I mean, I, I feel like for box office nerds, still kind of an under-discussed phenomenon that they were like, we're putting all three Star Wars movies back in theaters. We're releasing them three weeks apart each. They're each going to get their own healthy play. And that the first one played like a fucking modern blockbuster and the second one played like a solid hit and the third one was a little bit underperforming you think that's why they haven't tried that again just because like it didn't because to me it seems like it'd be a good idea every like 10 years just to be I know. like we're gonna put these back in theaters and make some easy cash i mean here's the thing i think if they did this if disney did this pure theatrical with the restored unspecial editions right the theatrical cuts restored perfectly and it was like we're putting them only in theaters this is the only way you've been able to see these movies legally in decades and then they'll go up on fucking digital and steelbook later i think they would make adjusted the exact same amounts of money i think they would be equally successful as re-releases i think it would be similarly a kind of phenomenon but um and it would be a true time is a flat circle moment that yeah. it went back around to anyway uh, for right. fuck the special edition right we're, we're going as analog as possible but i do think it would work i think it's it, there was a wave after this of a lot of uh, kind of bigger attempts at re-releases and especially where like oh what if you add back in shit what if you remaster fix shit or whatever and it's like there was an exorcist re-release that did pretty well it was like yeah. number one halloween weekend but pretty Version well never seen right pretty well was as well as return of the jedi did which was i think the wildest expectation they had for how these re-releases could do and what's wild is that a New Hope was still the sixth highest grossing film of 1997, I think. I mean, the re-release was like played about as big as any movie that year. It made $120 million and opened to 40 in 1997. Like it, uh, it, And can you tell me what number two at the box office is this week? Uh, Star Wars, correct? Yeah. Correct. Right. Like fucking Empire dethroned Star Wars from the top right. of the Star box Wars office. Star Wars had been... Number one for a month, and Empire Strikes Back is knocking it off. Insanity. I, I mean, it's also just like I was going down this rabbit hole of um, th th watching nerdy YouTube videos about fucking Star Wars merchandise, but they talked about the fact that like 
Star Wars had been so big, right? And then continued to have a tail for a handful of years after Jedi and then kind of disappeared. Like, whereas yeah. Trek was staying in the spotlight, Star Wars became like a thing the way we talk about like Beetlejuice now. You know, like, oh, that was a movie from my childhood that I liked a lot. And then in like 1995, they started making the toys again. And it was seen as weird to make toys from a movie that was 15 years old at that point. But they sold better than expected. And Lucas is obviously tinkering with like getting ready to do the prequels at this point. Then like 96, 97 is Shadow of the Empire. Yeah, I was about to say this, this, this. I didn't know, I didn't know that Star Wars had been away. And so Shadow of the right. Empire suddenly makes way more sense what they That's were trying the to thing. do there. Right, yeah, and it was right. like, well, can we do sort something to get people again. a little bit excited about Star Wars? Can we do everything but a new movie? We'll have a video game. We'll have a book. We'll release a soundtrack. We'll have toys. We'll have comics. We'll do everything. That game fucking whips, too. Yeah, and, like, all the shit was good, and it was well-received, but in the way that, like, you would expect an attempt to revive a nerd property would be received. And then the special editions came out. And I don't remember the timeline of Shadow of the Empire was slightly before or slightly after, but that was clearly meant to be their major play. And like the special editions were sort of like, this is a promotional opportunity for the new remastered VHSs that are about to come out. And instead, it just worked and became as culturally big as it was when it first came out. Like it just played like a fucking modern movie. And Star Wars was the biggest movie for me in grade school in the way it was for my fucking dad. Like it, it just—it's such a bizarre phenomenon. All true. It was the—you know—you took your parents. Yeah. To your your parents. Sorry, your parents took their kids. Like that's what happened with me. It was you know it was like let's pass it on. That was the sort of thing going on. But I do but think there was partially. I just want to say the event status of them saying there's going to be one of these every three weeks. That was sort of a phenomenon that no one was able to replicate in just a single movie re-release. I, it will happen again, but I don't know what, and I don't. It'll know probably why. happen with Star Wars. Sounded like a song. Yeah, it'll probably be fucking Star Wars. Uh, number three at the box office is a film from a great American auteur who's in a bit in his weird 90s post Oscar fallow period. Not mm. that he made bad movies, but I feel like he was not taken seriously post. Is it Oliver Stone? No. One Oscar. He won one Oscar. Uh, uh, yeah, he might have won two. He certainly won Best okay. Director. He probably won Best Picture. And yeah. it's not it's not Demi or Zemeckis, obviously. No. Is it Barry Someone Levinson? we talk about all the time. No. Someone we talk about all the time, Griff. Uh, he's still making movies. He's got a movie coming out Clint? this year. God bless him. Clint it's Eastwood. A Clint. It's a Clint. It's a 97. Clint. And I've, 97. February. He had two movies in 1997. Is it? Uh, w- yes. Both no. based on bestsellers. Uh, Bridges? Right. It's not the Bridges it's of Madison Bridges. County. It's that was his previous one. film. Right. Well, Fuck. he had two movies in 97. This is a is thriller. Is it Midnight this in the Garden a... of Good and Evil? No, that was his other film in 1997. <laughs> okay, is the one he that he's in not this one? in. He's is, in this one. Is it Bloodwork? Is that what that movie's called? No, I love that movie, Bloodwork. That is 2002. Uh, that, I would say, is one of his, his best movies. This is not a movie I love, but it's absolutely absolute stat power? cast. It's absolute okay. power. It's the movie in which, of course, uh, cat burglar... Clint Eastwood witnesses the president getting a blowjob uh, and then gets drawn into a massive conspiracy and Gene Hackman plays the president. They keep telling the same story over and over again, Hollywood. <laughs> I just, I just, I kind of just imagine Clint being like, you know, I could have stopped Bill Clinton. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> if I had been peeping on that blowjob, none of this would have happened. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So number one is uh, Empire Strikes Back. Number two is Star Wars. Number three is a Clint Eastwood uh, beach thriller. Okay. Number four. Number four is a disaster movie, a uh, real disaster movie um, hmm, that famously is coming out the same year uh, as um, Volcano. Is Dante's, Dante's, Peak? Dante's Peak. It's Dante's Peak. It's Dante. Yes. One of the few Linda Hamilton movies. Yeah. You know, that's not a Terminator, like post-Terminator 2, right? 
I, I I was rereading that great New York Times profile that came out before Dark Fate because Dark Fate uh, also uh, whips and I have been uh, trying to finally get my friends to watch it and come to the light. Um, but uh, uh, she she just talked about that she was just like, Cameron kept on being like, you should be the next action star. You could run with this. And she's like, I don't really care. And Volcano is the one time she sort of like tried to play the game. I was like, I don't give a shit. I'll retire. Fuck you. Um, Tante's Peak is fun, right? Like, I, 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 okay, you never seen it. Uh, Jamel, have you seen Dante's Peak? I've not seen it for years. I I remember I remember seeing it in theaters because uh, my parents from the military over the summer, maybe the previous summer, whenever whenever it had come out, I know I was at like the military on base childcare, and they took the older kids to see movies on occasion. And so I know it. That's when I saw Dante's Peak. I will say I was absolutely terrified of lava as a child, and the I mean, trailers all... for Dante's Peak and Volcano made me shit myself. I could not handle them. I had nightmares from the trailers. My worst nightmare. I embraced lava. I have to say, I was the what? opposite. I love lava. <laughs> <What a> surprise. <laughs> I just remember the volcano trailer flipping me out because I was like, wait a second. The whole reason I live in a city is because uh, I'm far away from volcanoes. You're telling me it could reach our streets? But essentially lava's wet fire. Oh, and like, boy. I mean, come on. Like, wh wh what more do I need to say but that? It is wet fire. That's a very good put good way of putting it. It rules. Um, I... Also was scared of lava, Griffin. And there's a scene in Dante's Peak that is probably not that intense, but I remember it really freaking me. Is out. this when the grandma gets uh, burned up in the in the lake? Correct. I'm, uh, I'm waving my like, arms up, simulating being burned up in a lake. But she's that's exactly. acid. It's probably by the way. It's not even. That's not lava. He, she's in acid water. That's a completely different thing. <laughs> Jesus. Christ. Look, clearly we need to do a Roger Donaldson series just yeah. to sort of sort through all this. Or let's do. We could do a Patreon lava franchise with Dante's Peak, Volcano, and Lava. Um. Right. Uh, I, I yeah, it would be you. fun. Lava is the I most disturbing and the, distressing the of most, those three. The most chilling. <laughs> it, it's it's Pierce Brosnan in Dante's Peak, right? Yeah, yeah. It's Pierce and Hamilton. Um, number five is a film, a late entry in a comedy franchise. Vegas Vacation? is called Vegas Vacation, and there you go. <laughs> I was like, what else can I say about it? Yeah, no, no. Is this the final vacation? It's the final theatrical. Yes, it's the and final it's, theatrical. It's right. the one where National Lampoon was like, you don't need to put our name on this one. We, we <laughs> right. want to save our prestige for uh, uh, Van Wilder to the rise of Taj. Don't tarnish our name with Vegas Vacation. But there were, there were TV movies. They did a fucking Christmas 2 Cousin Eddie there's a there's another one I think with the fucking Judge Reinhold and Brian Cranston weirdly. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Um so that is a you know this you know this is the thing about Rosewood. This is the thing I want to say about this you know. Sure Dante's Peak is a mini blockbuster, but mostly it's being dumped against this competition that is like the Star Wars re-releases and like, you know, the fourth vacation movie, you know, number six is right. Fools Rush In, which I think is like the second of many Matthew Perry attempts at stardom. Uh, that's the one where it's like, what if you married Salma Hayek? And I'm like, sounds fine. And the movie's yeah. like, no, it's a problem. I'm like, I don't yeah. think it's. A problem. <laughs> I'd love to. It sounds like a real champagne problem to me. I'd love to have that kind of problem. <laughs> and then like, you know, it's a bunch, you know, the bottom half is a bunch of Oscar movies that are left over. Jerry Maguire, right. The English Patient, Scream, Evita, you know, like right, stuff But to like this that. point, like the Star Wars re-releases are not supposed to be playing like blockbusters. They're supposed right. to be the, topping out at 30 mil total. The oh, the only new movies this week are Rosewood, Blood and Wine, which is opening uh, 100 screens, and yeah. Lost Highway, yeah. uh, which hopefully we'll do on this show in a million years from now whenever we figure out how to cover Twin Peaks. But, but um, kind of right, a dumped lynch in many ways. Dump, dump. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Jamal, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. This real pleasure. Happy to talk about this movie. Glad I got to rewatch it. You know, I, I don't think I would have ever yeah. like, thought to rewatch it. And it's it's uh, 
it's an interesting enough movie that I might even like write about it since I I am allowed to just sort of like write about whatever shit's on my mind. So, um, I yeah, I I want you to know. Uh, I told you right before we started recording, but I I made a failed too late hail mary pass attempt to get Altman over the the hump, the Carpenter hump in March Madness. Uh, uh, last night as of this recording, um, to uh. Uh, by getting my father to to do a video stumping for for Bob, and I sent him your video as an example of what to follow, and he felt very intimidated after watching. And said, "Well, that guy's just too cool. I'm not gonna be able to do something that good." <laughs> but but the other thing he said to me, "What grip grip grip? Did did Jamel actually write about March Madness in the in the New York Times? <laughs> like he was concerned that you had." <laughs> abused your platform to stump for Jackie Chan in a Twitter poll. Listen, I know I I don't th- I don't think there are very many of my colleagues who listen to this podcast, so I can say this. Compared to what some of the other columnists have done, there is very little I could do to abuse my platform. I agree. Kapow! I Kapow! agree. <laughs> uh speaking of Uh, You should read uh, Jamal's column. Uh, Do not get scared off by the fact that it is in the op-ed section. (laughs) Um, But uh, and also say your your mailing list uh, is is always uh, great. Your your uh, uh, your email newsletter. Uh, Why why am I forgetting the newsletter? I got my newsletter. Yeah, yeah. it comes out every Saturday now. Uh, Um, always a good read. Yeah, so uh, people can subscribe to that, and I'm on Twitter, and you know, I'm around. And you're officially on the books for Spider-Man 3 whenever that happens. And if it doesn't happen soon enough, then we'll we'll find a very, very stupid episode to have you on between now and then. I mean, I'm sure on the Patreon you guys will get to the to to Spider the spider Men. No, we 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 gotta do Raimi. Griffin yeah. knows how I feel about this. Yeah. He's he's very we're very and close Doctor to Doctor Strange that. coming up. He's making his first that's, movie that's in right. a while. He's that's returned to superhero. I, I we I don't want to promise anything because we can't you promise know, you anything. Never know, there are variables but, at play. But that is how I am feeling let's about just, it right now. Let's That's just fine. say this. Raimi's on the tarmac right now. Exactly. I, exactly. I I know we're wrapping up. I am fast. I'm so looking forward to what Raimi is going to do with a Doctor Strange movie. Even even within the context of like the Marvel machine, yeah. I just feel like letting Raimi, especially if they're just going to let him indulge his style yeah. with one of these. Like yep. I'm, I'm fascinated. I still a couple months ago it was like someone was clowning on Spider Man two on Twitter. Like yeah. you, 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 you millennials like returns. this, and it's yeah. like, motherfucker. Yes, this is a great movie. This is like yeah. the closest thing these movies get to greatness. Yeah, it's still the high water mark, as far as I'm yep. concerned. Agreed, and that's one reason we got to cover him, and then yeah. we got to talk about three. He's on the tarmac and they're signaling and Raimi's going like, do I have permission to to fly? And we're right. like, hold on, we're get, we'll get you in we're there. We're checking we the weather. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's some traffic. But there are yeah, a couple we think other. So. Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to happen soon. And I, I mean, if that doesn't get people amped up for uh, that many series in that episode, then what will? Uh, thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thanks to Marie Barty for our social media, AJ McKeon and uh, uh, Alex Barron for editing assistance. Thank you to Lane Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song. Go to blankies.reddit.com for some real nerdy shit. Go to patreon.com slash blank check for blank check special features where we do commentaries on franchises, including uh, whatever one March Madness at this point we'll be doing. Um uh, tune in next week for Shaft, a real left uh, turn of yes. a movie from this one. Shaft. Very excited though. I'm gonna yes. watch all the Shafts. I think I am going to as well. I got the box set or the 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 three movies and also the TV movies. And my aim is to watch everything before this because I think this is an opportunity to talk about the weirdness of the Shaft franchise. We got a great guest lined up for that one. Uh, so tune in and. As always. Did you freeze? Oh, okay, you're thinking. No, it's just a serious episode. I don't really know what to say here. I'm trying to think of anything to call back that isn't tasteless. Lava is fire water? Wet fire? Very well done.
Oh, hold on. Remember to follow Griffin. Oh, ben. I know. I'm sorry, but this is the thing. Subscribe. It's not a word anymore. The language has changed. They've canceled the word. It's, it's canceled across on all platforms. So you, you get, you got it. Your spiel. You got to say follow now. I'm sorry. Ben, you explained this to me and I was making a point of saying subscribe again because I'm trying to be the resistance, but perhaps resistance is futile in this well, case. You know, do you, but I just, as okay. a reminder, please continue. Great. Here's what I'll say instead. Thank you all for listening. Please just fucking keep listening to this show. <laughs> 